Uh, good morning, everybody. Morning, Chair. Yes, morning. Chair. Lindy, I am seeing something called final, uh, the, the final program. I'm a bit confused because I had a program that you sent yesterday. It's the same, Chair. Oh. I was just saying, maybe in case you, you miss oh, it somewhere. Okay. Yes, that's right. the same Chair. Uh, can we do a, a quick roll call? Uh, good morning, Chairperson. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, good morning, members of the public. Um, uh, I wish to confirm the following members that are present in today's public hearings. Uh, we have you, um, uh, Member Kungubele, uh, the Chairperson of this committee. We have Member Abrahams. We have member Van der Merve, we have member Mvana, we have member Opperman, we have member Iris, we have member Bilangulu, we have member Masango, we have member Motawung. Uh, those are the members that were, are with us. If I've left out any members, I, she or he can indicate so. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much uh, in that. So in that, in, in that uh, case, we can proceed. Yes, Chair, we're a quorum. We can take decisions. <coughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you. May I take this opportunity to, to welcome everyone mm -hmm. and all those who have been supporting this uh, journey and those who have joined us today to continue to share with us uh, their perspective with regard to how do we create an environment for children which ensures minimum conditions for them to grow as required to become the viable human beings who constitute the foundation for the future of this country? Mm -hmm. We've listened to a number of presentations which have been inspiring, others painful, touching, sometimes traumatizing, uh, but uh, as a committee, we will try to avoid being emotional uh, to the extent that uh, we forget to put uh, our intellects at the center of the whole process. It's a very, very important journey. The more I'm involved in it, the more I realize, if I thought I appreciate it, the program of the foundation phase of building the viable human beings for a future nation. If I thought I understood it, uh, this program is actually opening my mind. I knew and I'm getting a better person and I listened to other portfolio committee members who seem to be sharing the same sentiment. Having said all that, uh, uh, Lindy, it's, it's still 20 minutes, am I right? Yes, Chairperson. The Thank status quo remains. Thank you. Yes, we have to stick to that 20 minutes at all material times because there are many presenters who want to talk to us. So others spoke for 20 minutes so that you can have a chance to come and present to us. You must then speak for 20 minutes so that others can also come and have a chance to speak to us. Uh, the immediate uh, lineup for this morning, up until uh, 11 o'clock, is Consortium for Refugees and Migrants in South Africa, uh, Mr. Tifulufedi Sintumule. You will correct my pronunciation if it's bird. Seliganda. From Skalbrini Center, the bridge, Ms. Tandega Ranzi, Door of Hope, mm -hmm. Ms. Nadine Graham, Prof. N. Skelton, Prof. N. Skelton. <laughs> okay. Now uh, it's five past nine. Mr. Tufulu Fedi, take the platform and walk us through.
And can please people make sure that they open their video for coverage purposes and the public to see who is speaking to them. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson, and good morning, um, the Portfolio Committee members and members of the civil society organization and the communities as large. Um, my name is Tifuru Peri Sintumure, um, but you, for this proceeding, you can call me for to make things easier. Um, yes, can, I'm the- You can call you, can call you what? Furu, F-U-L-U. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I had you, Chair, uh, apologizing and apologies accepted. <laughs> okay. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, as I was indicating that I'm the executive director for the Consortium for Refugees and Migrants in South Africa. Um, in short, it's called COMSA. Uh, we are a membership-based organization with about 26 member organization in good standing. Uh, whom their objective uh, is the promotion and the protection of the human rights of asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants at large who are within South Africa, the region, and globally. Uh, and within our membership, we have got the legal practitioner, the activist, the academia, uh, the community groups, and so on. Um, we welcome this opportunity. If that's possible for multi Are you, uh, are you able you to see my screen? You are multi, whatever. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, you can. Okay, so I, I, will, I will skip the slide number two because I have already spoken to it. Um, uh, Linda, I don't know how do you remove the, the part on the right on the Zoom. Uh, so that the presentation can be visible. Uh, but it is visible from my side. Uh, maybe I can quickly run it. I have already indicated uh, that COMSA welcomes this opportunity and is pleased to make this submission before the Portfolio Committee on Social Development. Um, and COMSA is a national uh, with current membership of 26 member organization, as has already indicated. Uh, I can quickly go to go and share with you what COMSA does uh, quickly in one minute. Uh, COMSA's work involves engaging in advocacy, lobbying, uh, including policy submission, coordination, and network building, mm -hmm. including capacity building with community engagement and dialogues, and raising awareness on human rights of asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants, including their dependents, including the stateless, including the children in migration, and all the children that are in content, as you will know that, Children's rights are very uh, paramount of importance to everyone. And COMSA members include practice, legal practitioner, community refugee groups, and advice offices, academia, and social services. So I have already indicated. So to begin my presentation, as COMSA, we recommend that the following acts and policies should be taken into consideration when engaging in this bill. Uh, we should look at the Constitution of South Africa, the Bill of Rights, especially Chapter 2, Section 28, uh, which talks more specifically to the rights of children uh, in particular, so that we are able to consider and respect all the child rights that are available for child to explore and benefit from as it, they are enshrined within the Bill of Rights. Of course, children do benefit from all the rights that are enshrined within the, the Bill of Rights, like the rights to education, right to a name, right to shelter, right to uh, documentation, and so forth. So we also submit to them a portfolio committee that the Refugee Act, uh, number 38 of 1998, it should be taken into consideration when amending the Children's Act or, or during this process of the Children's Amendment, because it also have a certain section that deals with issues of uh, refugee dependent, including the asylum uh, dependent who are in the country because of whatever situation that presented in their country that led to them leaving their country of origin to come to South Africa to seek refuge. And then we also request in the portfolio committee to also engage the Immigration Act uh, of 2002, which talks to issues of uh, economic migrants, dependents, and then the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, especially Article 49, and even the African Charter on Rights and Welfare of the Child uh, from the African Union perspective, including the Children's Charter of South Africa, 
uh, that was developed and drafted from the summit that was held in Cape Town in 1992, uh, including the Child Justice Act that deals with issues of child arrest and how children can access justice. Uh, recently, uh, the Department of Home Affairs, is, uh, if I can bring it before the Portfolio Committee on Social Development, that they are embarking uh, on the amendment of the Birth and the Death Registration Act of 2010, which it will be interesting uh, for the Portfolio Committee to have a look in terms of what is the Department of Home Affairs proposing uh, in terms of access to birth certificate, access to documentation and registration of birth especially on the children who are, are, are dependent of the migrant or children in migration. In our language here in Comsa, we normally refer all the migrant children, uh, children in migration because they are here through migration purposes. So we are appealing uh, before the Portfolio Committee on Social Development to have a look at the draft uh, uh, um, proposal that Home Affairs is having on the table with regard to the birth and death registration amendment act, so that when they are uh, addressing the issues within the children's amendment, you are able to also incorporate some of the proposal that Home Affairs is proposing. Uh, to move in the second slide, uh, we also want to submit to the portfolio committee that they should take into consideration the following categories uh, of children. Because in South Africa, we have got the unaccompanied and separated migrant children who are in South Africa, and we have come across quite a number of them. And then the refugee and asylum seeker dependents and the economic migrants dependents, including the stateless children. Uh, in South Africa, we have quite a number of people who are stateless, people who are not recognized here in South Africa, and they are not recognized in their country of origin. Therefore, they remain or they become stateless with no country to belong to. We are saying um, or submitting before the portfolio committee, please, when we are engaging in this uh, children's amendment, could we uh, with warm hands and warm heart, as you indicated, Chair, that the more you engage in this issue, the more uh, uh, you become uh, attached to it. Same applies to the Consortium for Refugees and Migrants in South Africa, because when we engage with the stateless children or dependent of the stateless children, we come across those children who don't know where they belong and they are writing more often they get to be violated. And then we are saying we do have the undocumented children of both migrant and South African and South Africa in, in here in our, uh, our country. And then we are saying it's, the bill should also consider the incorporation of the orphan and the adopted children. Um, as I continue, I will be making a few submissions that we have picked up from the bill that was published for us to make comments on, uh, but the submissions have already been received uh, by the portfolio committee, which in depth explains uh, what our submissions are or what our recommendations are within the bill, because we have gone through the bill and these are, this is some of the recommendation that I have picked up to say should uh, let me uh, present this one because they are the burning ones, but the whole submissions are before the portfolio committee. Uh, we submit that in the section one, subsection B and A, COMSA recommend that the inclusion of the caregiver in this subsection for the section to read uh, counseling of parent, guardian or caregiver of the child. Because in more situations you find out that caregiver they get not to be recognized when the affairs of the children are being addressed. And in South Africa, it's more uh, um, regularly happening uh, where you find that uh, is the grandmother, is the auntie, is the uncle who is taking care of the child where the parents are not available or the children have become often. We are saying in this subsection, can you consider uh, to include caregiver because they automatically in more occasions become the immediate uh, child uh, carers. And then the act must, con must be consistent in using these three parties because when we were reading the bill, we have realized that caregiver is mostly left out where the parents or uh, guardians are mentioned in the bill. So we are making this submission before the portfolio committee to say, can you there be a consistency in using or including caregiver in all um, uh, legal guardian of a, of, of a child where it's necessary. We are also making the following submission in terms of section one uh, B8. Uh, Comsa recommends the inclusion of the Department of Social Development on the definition. Uh, I also indicated that see Comsa submissions uh, attached 
um, because if this if Department of Dep uh, Department of Social Development is not included uh, in the process uh, or, or in the any institution that is taking care of the children, that might bring uh, some element of challenges because there has to be some monitoring and reporting in terms of who's actually taking care of the children, who's actually addressing uh, um, affairs of the children. We are also saying uh, in section 1BK, uh, Comsta proposes the inclusion of the religious because we saw that religious uh, was not included. It was only spiritual uh, and um, the other aspects of, uh, of, of religious affiliation that was included. We are saying there are a lot of children who are solely dependent on their religious affiliations uh, that they belong to. And by leaving religious uh, out of that paragraph or out of that station might present some challenges when children issues or affairs has to be engaged or be addressed or be met. Uh, we are also saying in section 1BV, uh, Comsa submits that section V be reviewed to include valid registration certificate uh, in terms of the social uh, welfare practitioner who will be handling the affairs uh, of the children. Uh, this has been explained thoroughly in our submissions. Uh, you can have a look in our submissions. We are saying by omitting valid registration certificate, uh, the South African social service profession uh, certificate might hamper the affairs of the children because in many occasions, everyone who's handling the affairs of the children and will be listening or assisting the affairs of the children, in many occasions, they should be registered with the South African social okay. services professions. Uh, and then we are also saying in 7.2, Comsa recommends the inclusion of living uh, and special needs um, because there was an omission uh, in that section uh, of people who are living with the special needs. So we are saying this because we have got quite a number of children out there that as Comsa, we have come across them who are living with special needs. In this section, we are saying they should be included in the bill so that their affairs can be uh, considered and can be taken into consideration when the bill is finalized and adopted so that they can also enjoy the same rights uh, compared to those who don't have special needs. Um, I'm about to finish. Um, and then we are also making the following submission in section 10A, subsection A and E, one uh, a family advocate we are saying magistrate uh, should also be included in that section uh, because it only talks about family advocate and in many areas especially in rural uh, areas where i come from in lois richard in limpopo province it's very rural in many occasions children affairs gets to be handled by the magistrate through the children's court so we are saying to accommodate those challenges that may present or that may arise from the rural area perspective, magistrates can they be included so that they can be able to intervene in these uh, scenarios. And then we are also making submission on section 14, um, in the insertion, the use of the word regional court, because in many areas, especially in rural areas where quite a number of uh, children challenges present themselves, uh, it's not easy to access the high court. I've seen this in my life when I was still uh, living in Limpopo area that to access high court uh, is a bit difficult. I will always, always make reference to the Limpopo province. We only have um, the regional court, which may be in, in, in Toyando, uh, which can be accessible and the high court might be in Pulukwan. So we are saying that re uh, regional court should also be included in this uh, scenario or in this section so that um, they can be involved if the high court cannot be accessed. We are also making uh, submission to section 21, subsection four, uh, to include uh, the definition of the domestic partner because it was just mentioned that domestic partner will be involved in these processes, mm -hmm. but it was not defined. We are requesting uh, with respect and the powers vested within the portfolio committee that domestic partner be defined because in our cultural norms and different religious affiliation, domestic partner can be interpreted in different ways and that can present quite a number of challenges. So we are requesting that if it's possible, domestic partner mm -hmm. be defined and be explained and be included under section one uh, with all the definition that has been included therefore. And then we are also making submission of section 24C. Um, so to propose the revision of the subsection uh, for the revision of the subsection, uh, are you still there? Yes. Hello? 
Yes. Oh, okay. I thought maybe uh, I have lost. Uh, I have lost your chest. So uh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, we are also saying uh, there should be an in, uh, uh, a revision of subsection twenty four C, uh, and uh -huh. to insert these pro, uh, proposed categories of children that we have indicated to you because they were not included in the categories of children in terms of need of, in need of care and protection. The categories of children that we are referring to is the one that I've shared with you, Chair, uh, the state as the refugee department, uh, the refugee dependent, the asylum seeker dependent, the economic migrants dependent, and the separated and unaccompanied uh, migrant children. Yeah. What happened now? Chair, uh, the presenter has unmuted himself. Unmute, sir. I, I don't know. Oh, sorry, sorry, Chair. I don't know what happened. Uh, you know, the technology sometimes, uh, some uh, of us would. Yes. I, thought, I, I thought you said you are wrapping up. Yes. Um, this is my second slide. As I was saying, in this subsection 24, say, oh, we are. Are you, are you wrapping up on your second slide? Uh, I'm trying to go to the last slide, which is has got a wrapping up sections. Okay, no problem. But I can't, I can't seem to go to that slide. Um, but the presentation, as I was already indicated, will be circulated with Lindy where, for your attention, Chair. Uh, maybe to make a few comments, as I can see that I can't go to the next slide, I can read from what I have. Uh, what, as, about, as the, what, about, what about three minutes to go? Oh, yes, I think that will do justice because I've got a few points that I wanted to make. Um, so we are also saying in section 78, um, as inserted by section four of the act, 421 of the 2007, COMSA submit that this section must be reviewed uh, or rephrased, taking into account the powers that are, are being vested upon the MEC uh, alone. So we propose that the MEC, before takes the decision of allocating the fund, should and must consult with the relevant stakeholders to avoid challenges that may present. Uh, if I can make example, we know that there are a lot of corruption issues that are taking place currently in South Africa, and we have seen many cases. So we are saying that the power of allocating the funds to any uh, institution that will be taking care of taking care of the affairs of the children, the MEC should not have the powers alone, he or she must consult with the relevant stakeholders before the allocation of funds can be done to avoid those challenges. And then we are saying the amendment of section 150 of the Act, section 28, uh, subsection DJ, COMSA recommend the insertion of separated for this section to read, is an accompanied or separated migrant children from another country because we have quite a number of those who are separated, not just unaccompanied. They are the ones that will come with their parents and when they arrive, something happens to their parents and then they became separated. We are requesting for the bill to include the separated children from another countries. And we are also saying in section 98, subsection B, uh, we submit that this section be reviewed to read as follows. In order to accommodate all children within the Republic, access to re rehabilitation services for children living with disability and special needs. This is to include these children who are living with special needs because only children who are living with disability were considered in this section. So we are requesting and submitting that children with special need be uh, catered for in this subsection. So our last uh, submission is the section 107, subsection D, uh, comes and recommend the inclusion of religious as well. So Chair, before you close, um, I will also want to send an apology and thank uh, uh, Portfolio Committee that I will not be here for the whole day. I've got a funeral in my family. Mm -hmm. My auntie has passed on. She's getting buried tomorrow. So I will have to attend to those proceedings. So, but at I will be time, here until 10, time, 11. At, at what time are you, are you leaving? I will be here until half past 10, 11. No, 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 as long as you are there by 11, that's the time we're engaging you for 30 minutes. Thank and you very much, Chair. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Seliganda. Good morning, Chair, and uh, honorable members of the Portfolio Committee. My name is Sally Gander, and I'm here with my colleague, Cindy Moyo. We're from the Scalabrini Center of Cape Town, and 
we thank the committee for allowing us to make this oral presentation today. The Scalabrini Center of Cape Town is a registered NPO and we perceive migration as an opportunity. We're committed to alleviating poverty and promoting development in the Western Cape while fostering the integration of migrants, refugees and South Africans. Um, Cindy and I both work in the advocacy program and the key um, aim of the program is to promote and strengthen the rights and integration of migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. I'd like to note that our presentation at the moment comes from our experience uh, in the advocacy program and specifically with our children's rights project, which works together with child and youth care centers, including Lawrence House CYCC, which is uh, a child and youth care center, uh, which is uh, connected with the Scalabrini Center of Cape Town and houses up to 25 um, migrant asylum seeker and refugee youth, as well as youth who've experienced trauma. Um, the experience that our children's rights program has, as well as um, the experience from our CYCC has informed our submissions today. We'd like to start uh, with a story. Um, we obviously are going to give this person a different name, but uh, it will, provide some of the practical barriers that, that we see in our everyday work with children. Um, and it speaks to specifically uh, what our oral submissions are on today, which is the potential offered by the Children's Amendment Bill for migrant asylum seeker and the refugee population in South Africa, and particularly in respect of unaccompanied and separated foreign children. Um, and so that's what our oral submissions uh, focus on. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Cindy, just to give uh, this personal account. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Uh, good morning, Chair, uh, the members of the Portfolio Committee and everyone who is participating in this engagement today. Uh, my name is Cindy from the Scalabrini Center of Cape Town. I'm just going to give you an account of um, one of the cases that we've uh, dealt with. This is a case of a child who has been admitted at one at, at our CYCC Lawrence House. I'll just give you a different name. Um, I will give you the name Asha. So Asha was admitted at the CYCC in 2014. Asha at that point, she was removed from the care of her mother due to ab abuse uh, allegations. Her mother is from the DRC. She came into South Africa with uh, Asha when Asha was about two years old and she applied for asylum at the Deben Refugee Office and she was granted refugee status in South Africa. But in 2014, due to abuse allegations, Asha is removed from her mother's care and she's placed, she's placed in a CYCC. At that point, the mother decides to go back uh, to DRC with Asha's younger brother. And then uh, down the line, the, the refugee status for Asha is expired. But unfortunately, we try to engage the Deben Refugee Office trying to renew the, the, the refugee status for Asha, but it's impossible because the principal applicant is not there. And we are advised that if Asha is separated from the refugee status for a mother, she would have to apply for her own asylum document, which is not possible because Asha uh, does not have her own individual refugee claim, meaning that even if she tried to apply for asylum, she would be rejected. And then also the, at that point, Asha's mother has gone back to DRC. The social worker continues to try to engage with her, but she makes it very clear that she doesn't want Asha anymore. She wants nothing to do with, uh, with Asha. She must not be called. At some point she starts uh, ignoring the calls or she just cuts the calls and sends messages that I don't want to talk to Asha. I don't want her in my life or close to my family members, and she just cuts a connection at all with Asha. Therefore, meaning that at that point, Asha is not documentation in South Africa because her refugee status cannot be renewed because the mother is not there with the principal applicant. And again, at that point, it is discovered that Asha does not have a birth certificate. According to the mother before she left, she indicated that Asha was born in Zambia but she did not produce any documents that prove that Asha was actually born in Zambia, no hospital documents, no birth certificate, no birth certificate even from, uh, from the DRC. So Asha does not have any documentation. 
which makes her at risk of statelessness because she doesn't have any she doesn't have any document that connects her either to Zambia or to DRC. There is no information about the whereabouts of Asha's father as well. So Asha at this point in time has no relative or anyone that she's linked to. And the mother is also cut connection. So these are some of the cases that uh, we have to deal with because again, Asha has been placed in a CYCC where she's being taken care of, but there's the issue of documentation because at some point Asha has to write metric no documentation, meaning that she might be able to write metric, but she will, she will not be able to get a certificate. And therefore, she won't be able to go to university. When she reached the age of 18, she, at some point, she has to exit uh, the CYCC. And also, uh, she become, once she exits the, 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 the CYCC, she becomes at risk of uh, arrest or deta uh, de detention or even deportation. But obviously, with uh, deportation, it will be difficult because there is no country that would actually accept Asha as, a, as their citizen. So meaning that she might end up in uh, be, she might end up in that cycle where she can be arrested, detained, or deported. And she's also at risk of statelessness because she has no documentation that links her to any country. And also, it's very difficult for Asha to get any immigration status under the Immigration Act because she does not have a passport. Meaning that she will not she will not be able to apply for any kind of visa in South Africa. So uh, this was just to give you an idea of the cases of, you know, unaccompanied or separated children who find themselves in the CYCCs. I'll hand over to my colleague Sally to talk more about how this case relates to the submissions that we want to make today. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. So Asha's case, um, she arrived in the country when she was two years old. She has no memory of any other country. South Africa is the only home she's known. No. She was protected while she was yeah, in... Yeah. Who's speaking? Sorry, this is Sally Gander again. Apologies, Chair. Um, so Asha was, was protected while she was in the care system as there was a children's court order uh, which provided her with that protection. But the moment that she ages out and exits the care system because she doesn't have documentation, uh, she is at risk. Uh, we also have found in our experience that it's not only that she is at risk when she exits the care system, but also that she is at risk in terms of her mental health and psychosocial well-being while she's in the care system because she has this looming deadline of when she turns 18 and when she exits the CYCC. None of those factors are in the best interests of a child. Um, and so when we read and our comments relating to the Children's Amendment Bill are really about children that are in the situation like, like Asha. Um, for a foreign child, uh, documentation and immigration status in South Africa are vitally important for their well-being and for their best interests. And what we saw in this amendment bill is that um, in our practical experience, there is often a disconnect when it comes to the realization of the best interests of the child standard where foreign children are concerned. This usually comes down to two things, documentation and immigration status. Uh, these both tend to be given when, what these both tend to be a given when you consider a South African child. Uh, in terms of documentation, a South African child will usually have, uh, although not always, a birth certificate with an identity number. And even if they have one South African parent, then they are citizens of South Africa. So they have immigration status here. It's a non-issue. For a foreign child, however, the impact of documentation and immigration status uh, impacts on their best interests and, um, and we find that often best interests for foreign children are overlooked or are secondary. Um, for the case of unaccompanied foreign children who've been placed in the care system, like Asha, um, where they don't have documentation, they often, the practical reality for those children is that they become a child in limbo between two governmental role players, the Department of Social Development 
and the Department of Home Affairs. I've already mentioned the negative mental health and psychosocial impacts. I'd like to draw the committee's attention to clause 24 of the bill, which relates to section 45 of the Children's Act. In this section, the Refugees Act 130 of 1998 is, is mentioned. And we would urge that the committee consider ensuring that regulations are made uh, relating to the interaction between the Children's Act and the Refugees Act. Um, the regulations need to show what actions the Children's Court can take uh, in order to have the positive effect that Clause 24 is envisaging. Um, and what we mean by this is that when a Children's Court adjudicates on a matter pertaining to an unaccompanied or separated migrant child, the court must be able to unequivocally order that the child be provided with documentation and immigration status by the Department of Home Affairs. Without having access to that documentation and immigration status, the child will remain stuck and their best interests will not be met. Um, and that is what we saw with Asha throughout her time in the care system. If we move on to Clause 82 of the bill, which relates to section 150 of the Act. Um, this section is about when a child is deemed to be in need of care and protection. And we were very pleased to see that the inclusion of unaccompanied migrant child is, is um, included in this clause and um, in this section. Uh, we, we want to be very clear that it needs to be unaccompanied child, not separated child, because they are, are different. And um, that is the way that it is framed at the moment. Um, an unaccompanied child should fall within the ambit of section 150. Um, but in addition to that, there are specific steps that would need to be taken in terms of the care management for such a child. One of the first steps, again, is to ensure access to documentation and immigration status. This is in the long-term best interests of the child and will offer a durable solution for that child. At present, as in the case with Asha, there is no easy pathway to documentation for such a child. And so um, what we really urge is that the Department of Social Development and this committee engage with the Committee on Home Affairs and engage with the Department of Home Affairs in order to create a special dispensation for children. Um, such a special dispensation would be able to be created through Section 31.2b of the Immigration Act, um, which allows for a category of uh, visas to be created, similar to one of the ones that many people are familiar with is the Zimbabwe exemption permits. We urge that a specific exemption permit be created for children. What we see in our work and the example of Asha is one of many examples is that children, especially unaccompanied children in the care system have no pathway to documentation. This impacts on their best interests. And so, there needs to be, in order for section 150 and the protections that are offered there to be effective, there needs to be a pathway to documentation and immigration status for unaccompanied children. And section 31.2b of the Immigration Act offers that pathway. It just needs to be actioned. And uh, we believe that a dialogue between the relevant departments would be critical in in ensuring that that action does take place and that the best interests and protection of unaccompanied children like Asha are best served. Um, what, what we did do to assist Asha is we applied for an individual exemption in terms of 32.1b of the Immigration Act. And we were successful in getting that exemption, although it took many years. Um, and so that was many years of uncertainty for this child and we've spoken to her social workers and caregivers at the CYCC, and it is clear that it did take a mental health uh, toll on this child. And so 
we'd like to see a special dispensation in order to avoid that for future ushers. Thank you very much to the committee and um, yeah, we, we will remain here for questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you very much. Uh, the other Sin ladies. Thank the you, other ladies. The other lady is Cindy Moyo. She okay. is an and so Asha is the, the narrator. Asha is uh, the name, the pseudonym that we gave as an example. But that, but that reality does exist. It does exist. It is a real person, and it's not just yeah. one real person. It is if, many. If I, if, I, if I get you, Sally, you are, you are saying, yes. under no circumstances, a child must be left without tools of successing services for his or her right to grow. Absolutely. Under no circumstances should we be preventing a child to thrive. And one okay. of the ways that a child who is undocumented and doesn't have immigration status, one of the, the ways that we can open a door for them to thrive is through ensuring that there are pathways to documentation and immigration status. The and tools. A child must, must not be without tools to access mm -hmm. the services that ensure that the child grows normally. Yes. Yes. That's okay. absolutely correct. Thank you, Chair. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll engage you at 11. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the next item is the bridge. Uh, Ms. Tandega Ranzi. Thank you, Chair. Um, am I audible? You are very audible. Okay. I, I want to know whether you are Hansi or Ranzi or... I'm Ranzi, Chair. Thank you very much. So I was Tandega. correct. Tandega Ranzi, yes, you were correct. Thank you. Mm. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. On behalf of Bridge, I would just like to extend our gratitude for this opportunity to present to the Portfolio Committee. Um, Chair, I believe you have our presentation. Um, I, circulate, I, I sent it yesterday. Yes, I, yes, yes, I saw yours. Okay. So um, I'm happy to continue without sharing my screen. Um, but if upon your request you feel it's necessary, then I'm happy to share the screen. Okay, members will speak for themselves. I think everyone has got that presentation. I hope so. If they don't, I'm, they'll tell us. I'm asking Chair that she must share, please. That request is humbly made, uh, Tandega. Okay, Chair. Sure. Let me just um, maximize my, uh, okay. Right, okay. So, um, Chair, I'm here today on behalf of Bridge, um, Bridge Innovation in Learning. We are a registered nonprofit organization and we aim to connect innovators in education to promote, to promote systemic change. We do this through convening multi-stakeholder communities of practice across various focus areas in education, including early childhood development. The stakeholders that we host in our communities of practice chair include funders, providers, government officials, as well as practitioners. And in our communities of practice, we provide our, stake, our stakeholders a space where they can share learnings, working practice, where they can also network and also collaborate. We then document and share working practice and other resources from our communities of practice, from our communities of practice members. So Chair, we're currently running a community of practice for early childhood development, and we host many ECD stakeholders on a quarterly basis. 
we come together to tackle common challenges and issues within the ECD sector and come up or try to come up with solutions that are workable within our own working environments. However, since the inception of the community of practice in 2013, we realized here that many of the issues and challenges remain unchanged. They remain unchanged, Chair, because changes have to happen within the legal framework. And we are in full support of the real reform for ECD campaigns call for the five key reforms, which I will speak to um, in much more detail later in my presentation. Chair, our motivation to submit um, uh, to submit to the portfolio committee is that we realize that the scales are tipping too slowly towards universal access to quality ECD services as stipulated by the National Development Plan. And unfortunately, the biggest losers are our children who are also the most valuable assets of this country and its advancement. So Chair, we have therefore come up with a number of requests that we, would kind, that we are kindly requesting the portfolio committee to consider. Our first request, Chair, that we would like to put forward to the portfolio committee is that a second, amendment, a second amendment, amendment bill process take place much sooner rather than later. It has come to our attention that the, the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee for Social Development has rejected all ECD related amendments in the Children's Amendment Bill. Um, and that the decision has been made to deal with these in a second amendment bill process. We are in full support of this decision. However, we would like to stress that a second amendment bill process that advocates for true reform for the ECD system should happen quite soon rather than later. And so Chair, we would like to urge the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee to commit to a clear timeline for the second amendment, amendment bill process, because unfortunately the ECD sector can no longer afford to wait much longer for reform. Our second um, request Chair to the Portfolio Committee is the consideration of a one-step registration process for ECD providers, and that different types of ECD providers must be regulated accordingly. We are requesting this, Chair, because we realize that currently the registration process is lengthy and administratively burdensome, not only to ECD practitioners, but also to the officials who have to respond to the needs of those who require registration. Our ECD service providers currently have to register as ECD programs and then also as partial care facilities. And in each of these categories is a long list of norms and standards that have to be adhered to. Partial care registration requirements require structural municipal requirements, environmental health standards, health and law uh, and, and bylaws. Many of the norms and standards in the ECD program registration are a duplication and do not make a distinction between different types of modalities, such as toy libraries, parenting programs, and play groups. This is an indication of a flawed coordination system between government departments, Chair. And most unfortunate is that the expansion of ECD service goes is, undeni is denied for the estimated 3.2 million children under five who still do not access any ECD programs in, in, in this country. The ECD policy highlights the importance of the different modalities and, prize, and primes them as key in achieving universal access to ECD. But these modalities need to be sufficiently accommodated through the Children's Act. Mm -hmm. A one-step registration process would simplify registration for all ECD programs and could afford government the benefit of improving information systems of ECD services, which would also improve regulate the regulation of ECD services in this country. Thirdly, Chair, we are requesting that a consideration be made that any child who is in need of the subsidy be allowed to be given this uh, be allowed to be given the subsidy if they do need it. The reality is that children who majority are in poor communities need ECD services, but their caregivers are not in a position to, uh, to pay any exorbitant fees for ECD services. 
Chair, there are ECD centers that charge between 30 and 40 rand for fees. And this is not adequate to attend to the needs of the, S of the ECD services, nor the needs of the children. The subsidy is designed to assist those children whose caregivers are not able to afford and are not able to afford so that they can also access ECD services. A critical compromise in denying some children the subsidy is nutrition, Chair. ECD services are well placed to promote and provide the right type of nutrition. So one can find that in an ECD center where all the children are child, grant, um, child support grant recipients, you could find that um, only a third of these children are being funded through the subsidy. And obviously this then compromises on nutrition as well as other needs of the children um, during the day as they spend the day in the ECD programs. Fourthly, Chair, we are kindly requesting that it be made clear that conditional registration can be granted to ECD services if they are unable to meet all of the registration requirements and that MECs must support providers to meet requirements and that they should report on the systems of support that has been provided to these ECD services. Chair, conditional registration is a developmental approach that the Department of Social Development uses to incrementally register ECD services. And while it is a commendable tool, moving ECDs from a conditional registration to a full registration is a very slow process. There is no clear process for conditional registration. It is applied inconsistently within the provinces and it is not being utilized. It is not being widely utilized. So we are requiring that the provincial application of this very um, important development tool be enforced and that its utilization be reported through relevant institutions and structures so that we can ensure accountability. The last request chair that we would like to put forward to the committee for kind consideration is that in the infrastructure needs of the sector be supported. Infrastructure remains a huge barrier in registering ECD services and ultimately qualifying for government assistance in the mm -hmm. form of the subsidy. Practitioners lack the financial resources to build appropriate structures because many of them usually depend on parents paying school fees. There is no flexibility in the subsidy to cover infrastructural or other needs besides those that are prescribed in the subsidy. So essentially the Department of Social Development subsidy cannot be repurposed for practitioners' infrastructural and immediate needs. A lot of our ECD practitioners constantly have to go, who are conditionally registered, have to go through a process of renewing partial care certificates. And this is an ongoing challenge because ultimately the only way that, or in many cases, the only way that our ECD services can, can um, access full registration is if they are able to meet infrastructural requirements. So in closing, we would like to appeal to this committee. We would like to appeal to government to consider the significant impact that the changes in the legal framework can bring to children and the women who work tirelessly to take care and prepare children for the schooling system. The work that these women do is critical to the economy because they assist many caregivers to work or to pursue opportunities for work whilst children are safely placed in ECD programs where they can also learn. The majority of these black women managing and owning these establish, establishments provide access to employment whilst they're also serving a real need in the community. Thank you, Chair. I would like to stop there. Um, that, is the, and that is the closing of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramsey. And, uh... We will be. We hope you will wait until we we engage with all of you guys at about eleven o'clock. Okay. Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank when you. I say eleven, is per the program. It could even be earlier than that because of the speed at which you guys are moving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Nadine Graham, Door of Hope. Good morning, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present today. I would like to share my screen, please.
Make your co-host now. That's all. Okay. Okay, it's uh, not enabling me to share my screen. You can share now, ma'am. You are co-host. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks. <clears throat> Right, I am Nadine from Door of Hope Children's Mission, and um, I want to present today on the South Africa's child abandonment crisis and the importance of adoption. Just a little bit short of history of Door of Hope, we were established in 1999, and we were the first organization to design and install the modern day baby box, also known as a baby saver. We currently manage three homes and in our three homes, we have 65 abandoned and unwanted babies in our care. Since we started in 1999, we have taken in 1,759 babies of which 237 babies came through our baby box. Of this number, only 329 babies were reunited with their biological extended family. The rest had no family who wanted them. Just some statistics on our intake. Uh, most of our babies come from, from hospital. They are either signed over by their families um, and given consent for adoption or they are abandoned in hospital. The other large percentage of our babies come um, are brought to us by the police. These are generally babies that have been found abandoned in an unsafe manner, but who have been found alive. We also get a lot of babies from um, mothers who come to our doors and um, hand over their babies and give consent for adoption. These are just general statistics. But for every, uh, every statistic, there's a child story. These are just some examples of how some babies ended up in our care. I want to share two specific stories that um, are just examples of the sad state of abandonment is in our country. Baby J was found by a homeless man who was scratching through the rubbish bins in Hillbrow one evening. And he was getting, um, going through all the bins and he just heard some wailing. He thought it was a cat um, and then realized that it actually came from one of the rubbish bins he was scratching in. He looked inside the rubbish bin and there was a plastic bag and in the plastic bag was a little baby. Of course, this homeless man got the fright of his life. The baby had no nose and he was bleeding and there were a few rats around. Um, the homeless man managed to get someone's attention who then contacted, uh, contacted a medical response team. But when the team arrived there, they took the baby out of the bag and this little baby boy nose, his fingertips and his gums had been chewed on by rats. He survived, he was taken to hospital and he was adopted by an amazing family who even before they even met him had booked all his plastic surgeon appointments in advance to reconstruct his nose. Another story is of baby Ezra who last year on a very cold winter's night, around midnight, some homeless men, men were walking the streets looking for a warm place for the night. As they got close to the bridge that goes over the highway, they heard muffled sounds. They moved closer and saw a big hole in the ground um, who, <laughs> where the noise was coming from. So as they walked towards the, the uh, noise, uh, one of the, the homeless men actually st stayed on the, on the highway. Um, and at that time, there was um, a patrol car coming down the off-ramp. So the man frantically started waving to get the attention of the patrol car, car coming down the off-ramp. The car pulled over and the police officer um, got out. I got his flashlight and he moved towards the hole at the same time calling for backup because it was 
quite late at night. Um, his, the backup arrived and a lady officer got out and ran down the embankment towards the hole. And when she got there, they realized there was a little baby in the hole. She picked up the baby and took the baby inside the car. The baby closed his eyes and tried to open them, but he was so, so weak. He kept moaning and he kept dozing off. His hands were frozen. He was extremely cold. It was one of the coldest nights last year. The police officers took him straight to hospital for a medical checkup and then they brought him to Door of Hope. Our pediatrician estimated him to be around six weeks old. We named him Ezra, which means help. He settled in very quickly and was showered with love and comfort. But just over a month later, very early one morning, we had to rush Ezra to the IC, to, to the emergencies at, at Joseph Jen. He was really struggling to breathe. It, it really happened so quickly. There was no, no time to waste. The doctor put him on a ventilator. It didn't work. They moved him onto an oscillator. That didn't work. And at one stage, they had to resuscitate him. But it was only in a matter of a few hours where our little warrior, Ezra, could no longer fight. His little body and his lungs had been fighting since the day he was born and left out on one of the coldest winter's nights. His body just gave up. We were very honored um, to have little Ezra in our care. And I've, I share a photo of him. Yeah, he was such a beautiful baby boy. And he died because of unsafe abandonment. Door of Hope has a baby box. A baby box does not encourage abandonment. It gives life, it gives hope, and baby boxes should be made legal as a safe alternative to babies being left somewhere to die. Parents who choose to safely relinquish their babies through a baby box chooses life, not death. I also just wanna share some extracts from a letter that a mom wrote when she left her baby in the baby box. To my son, there is nothing that I can say that will justify this. I've been praying for months for God to guide me, and then I found out about this baby box. Trust me, what I have done is for you to have a great chance in life. Wherever you may go, I want you to feel my love because I love you beyond words. You will be the subject of my daily prayer. I can't imagine to let you lead this life that I have. You deserve better. I chose to not abort you and you fought your way to be here. And I know that God will turn this experience in a testimony. There is a family out there that will become yours. I plead for your forgiveness, but I have no other choice. I love you. This is just one of many moms that have placed a baby in a baby box rather than leaving it somewhere to die. And many of, have, of them have left letters with their babies. The abandonment of babies is a major social problem in South Africa. Out of every three abandoned babies, two are found dead. Children have the constitutional right to life and unsafe abandonment threatens this right. Dated statistics from 2010 shows that around three and a half thousand babies are abandoned annually. 65% of these babies are newborn. 90% of these babies are under one year old. These numbers have not diminished since 2010. At the start of lockdown last year, I networked and uh, consulted with a few homes that do similar work to Door of Hope. 26 homes took in over 160 babies, of which almost 100 were abandoned. Just in social news article, social media news articles, and by word of mouth, we heard that 107 babies were found abandoned in unsafe places. Only 48 of these 170 babies were found alive. Door of Hope has taken in 58 babies since the start of lockdown, of which 34 were abandoned. How many more CYCCs in South Africa has taken in unwanted and abandoned babies? These babies are abandoned multiple times, first by their parent 
and then unfortunately by government because they are left in the system for so long. Dorofa believes the bill represents a missed opportunity to prevent unsafe abandonment and to get these children into family care as soon as possible. We believe that the bill can include protection measures to reduce and prevent abandonment, to distinguish between safe and unsafe abandonment, to raise awareness around safe abandonment, to remove the criminal sanction attached to safe abandonment, to include this and support the mother's right to privacy. It has to legalize baby boxes and savers as a safe alternative to unsafe abandonment. We have to, as a country, implement safe haven laws where mothers or family parents can safely leave their baby in a baby box at a police station or in a hospital without facing criminal prosecution. Every child has the human right to family. We support reunification and adoption. Each child deserves a permanency plan as close to intake as possible. As mentioned in many uh, previous presentations, delays damage children. Reunification should only be done if it is in the child's best interest. We've heard of too many stories where children have been reunited with their family only to be abused, in some cases even die or end up back in the CYCC. So before a child is reunited with family, it must be determined if it is safe to do so and in the best interest of that child. We believe that every child deserves a home and a family. Even those whose biological family don't want them or do not want to care for them or are not able to care for them. The policy and bill uh, fail to provide adequate options for permanency through adoption for children born from unwanted pregnancies or those who are abandoned. We believe that adoption serves the best interest also of the biological family who care about the child they're unable to raise but who still want a family for them. Family reunifications and adoption are taking longer due to government departments like the Department of Social Development and Home Affairs not issuing the needed documents timelessly. And all decision making with regards to adoption and reunification has to be expedited because again, delays damage children. Presentations from NAXA and uh, child protection organizations has in previous presentations mentioned the delays of uh, letters of recommendation from DSD and form 30s that need to be issued for adoption or reunification to take place. Um, we suffer, a lot of our children are in our care are with us for so long because of the de delay of these documents being issued. And it leads to emotional trauma for each child. Again, I just wanna share a few stories of children um, that are currently in our care. Little girl E is almost five years old. She's been with us since birth. Her adoption was delayed for various reasons. When she finally became adoptable, she was matched in April 2019. Due to long delays, this match fell through. She was matched with the family again at the end of 2020. Eventually in March, the mommy received her Form 30 but we've still not received the variation order from DSD. In the interim, the mommy decided that she will start visiting baby E so that they can get to know each other. But every time the mommy left after her visit, little E asked why she could not go home with her mommy. All her other friends could leave with their mommies and daddies. Little E is always inconsol inconsolable for two to three days after the visit from her mommy. Last week, we received the variation order. She can now finally go home to be with her mommy. Little Jay is four years old. She's been with us since birth, and for medical release reasons, her adoption was delayed. She was not adoptable for quite some time. In the interim, her biological granny found out about her. Initially, the birth mom informed her family that her baby was born dead, but the truth came out. The granny immediately started the process to get baby Jay into her care. She's been waiting months for her form 30 to be issued. Eventually, she received this form, but she has moved home in the meantime. 
Now we're waiting for an updated report from DSD social workers on the new living environment of the granny. This has been weeks already. Jay's granny has been visiting her. Every time granny leaves, Jay wants to know why can she not go home with her granny? Baby S is four years old. He has been with us since birth. His birth certificate was applied for. The Department of Home Affairs registered him as a girl. We had to apply for a correction. During the delay time, baby S turned one. This may, meant he had now had to appear in front of a panel to get a birth certificate because they said it was a late birth registration. It took months and months to get a panel back and more months to get a new birth certificate. Baby S was eventually matched with a lovely forever family. We are waiting for central authority approval. This has also been months. Baby S has seen many of his friends leave with, his, with their forever family, families. He asks, when will his family finally come? In the last couple of months, when his friends leave, he does not eat or sleep properly for a few days afterwards. He wants to know where his family is. How do we explain to preschool children who were matched to adoptive families or due to go back to their own families in 2020 that a year later, they still have not been able to go home with them? We have 15 children who are waiting for that little piece of paper that will allow them to have permanent family care. Some will go to their forever family, some go to live with their mommies, and some will go live with their with their grannies. All we are waiting for is that little piece of very important paper. As I've mentioned, delays in adoption and reunification can cause damage to children. And also CYCCs are have keeping these children in their care and in no time our spaces are taken up and then we don't have space for other abandoned or unwanted babies. There was a long-term study done in 2020 of more than, more than 100,000 children, and it was found that institutionalization of children are constituted as structural ne neglect, which is a form of child abuse. We have heard much about the 1, 000, first 1,000 days of a child's life, the needs of the most disadvantaged. Our children must be prioritized. The one, first 1,000 days is a very important period of a child's life where the roots of some of our most complex behaviors are laid down. And tragically, numerous factors in South Af Africa have led to a devastating orphan crisis. Children have been abandoned or relinquished, often with medical needs that require special um, services. Many orphans are in CYCCs because they have no family. If government does not have the, yes. You've got two minutes. Yes, I will be done, I will be done. If government does not have the capacity to place the children, what will happen to them? They're staying in care longer because of these delays. Um, prolonged residential care has a ne negative effect on the so uh, psychosocial development of children. Prolonged institu institutionalization, sorry, long word, stores up problems for society. And this has a long-term effect on our country. Children belong in families. They do not belong in homes. This was a little girl waiting for her, her adoptive family. The Children's Institute reported 2.8 million orphans in South Africa. Close to half a million are double orphans. Given these numbers, how are we doing in giving the children in need of adoption families? These are the statistics of the last couple of years on adoption. It is dropping every year. Just working off a figure of 500,000 double orphans, less than 25% are adopted. Maybe the state can work with 20, a quarter of a percent, sorry, but what about the other 99.75 in need of family? State social workers are overburdened and have limited resources to give focus on the orphaned children in our country that need families. I consulted with some CYCCs. They all commented, as you can see by these points, adoptions are taking longer and longer every year. 
making sure babies get the right kind of care, nutrition and stimulation is the best chance our society has at breaking the cycles of poverty, violence, alcohol and drug abuse. This may start in a children's home for abandoned babies, but it has to end up in a forever family home. If the Department of Social Development and designated child protection agencies work together to solve the problem of these orphaned and abandoned babies by placing them in families, our country and the future of our children will be much brighter and much happier. I just want to finish off with a quote of one of my favorite people, Mr. Nelson Mandela. There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than in the way it treats its children. Thank you very much. Mm. Can you repeat that quote? <laughs> yes, I can. There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than in the way it treats its children. Wow. Thank you. Uh, you've made a very strong case, ma'am. Uh, the Ezra story being the face of that case. And how government cannot allow itself to be an obstacle, even to situations where children are not going to be paid for by government, where people out of their own volition want to assist children who are abandoned, who need adoption, surely government can be an obstacle to that. Those are some of the things we are going to, we have to confront and they are getting very strong in this presentation. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you. Stay around, Nadine. Uh, we, we hear and we feel your pain. Thank you. Uh, Prof. and mm -hmm. Skelton. Yes, uh, Chairperson, um, honourable members, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. I do have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to um, pull it up. Uh, Chairperson, can you see my PowerPoint presentation on the screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to discuss with the Portfolio Committee. Just to tell you a little bit about my background in child law, um, I'm an advocate um, and a professor of law, and I've specialized in child law for my entire career. I was on the Law Reform Committee that drafted the Children's Act, and I was also involved in drafting the regulations. Um, and I also was um, involved in the consultations for the drafting of this amendment bill. Um, I'm very closely acquainted with the foster care court case, having been involved in, in that matter. And I also argued the amicus curiae submissions in the constitutional court uh, the, in the case that abolished corporal punishment in the home. Um, so those are really, you know, I think the areas that I've chosen to talk about um, today with a few other issues. Um, I want to also talk about the privacy of children subject to court proceedings, in other words, the protection of their identity, which is also something that has been the subject of a constitutional court judgment. Um, I will talk about corporal punishment. I want to talk about the issue of guardianship. Um, I would like to speak to the whole question of what is the comprehensive legal solution in relation to foster care. I would also like to talk about the Child Protection Register and the trends regarding the National Register for Sex Offenders, which of course is under a different uh, uh, piece of legislation, and the, the efficiency of the SAPS criminal record system. 
Um, and then finally, I would like to just um, note a concern that I have about children who are referred to child and youth care centers under the Child Justice Act. So the first point is about the privacy of children in court proceedings. And when I talk about the privacy, um, the, the, the issue that I'm really flagging here is the protection of identity of children who are in court proceedings because the media, of course, attend court proceedings. And as we know, they like to report in a very sensationalist way. And sometimes this can be very harmful to children. So the bill introduces a new provision in section six. It's, it's not amending a provision, it's actually introducing something completely new. And its aim is a good one. It aims to protect children who are involved in court proceedings. Now, the current Children's Act, before these amendments, protects the identifying information of children, but only for children in the children's court. As we know, the children's court is at the magistrate's court level. But children are also sometimes involved in high court cases, and these tend to be the cases that are very high profile that the media want to know about. Let me give you the example that you would all know of the kidnap case, like the case of Zephanie Nurse. Who, who was uh, 17 years and 10 months old when, her, uh, when she discovered uh, that she had been kidnapped at birth. And the media wanted to reveal her identity. Um, and it was a battle to stop that from happening and it required court cases and so on. Um, other examples of high court cases involving children would be child abduction cases. You know, when one parent takes a child to another country without the permission of the one parent, those cases end up always being in the high court. And they're also quite high profile cases. And then um, a case that I was involved in a few years ago was a case where two babies were swapped at birth accidentally in a hospital. Um, and we had to go to court about those children, but we had to ask the court to make a special order to protect the identity of the children so that the media wouldn't reveal um, who, what their identity, a provision that automatically protects children. Um, Chair, I, um, I notice, as I said, that, that the clause in section six is, is, uh, has a good intention, but it is not well drafted. Um, and what is very concerning is that the latest draft, um, not section 74 of the children, which means that now, children have no protection, even in the children's court. So that I'm sure is just a mistake that was made by the drafters, but I would ask the drafters um, and the portfolio committee to check that the drafters do fix that problem. So the law needs to come in line with a recent constitutional court case about this issue, which said that um, all children, um, including uh, children who are victims, um, need to be have their identity protected. And the current wording of the bill is not in line with the outcome of the court case. I have proposed alternative wording in my written submissions, and, and it will that wording would protect the identity of every child who is a party to or a witness in court proceedings. Um, but it also allows the person to waive that privilege or she turns 18. And here again, I would use the example of Zephanie Nurse, who, um, wanted her identity protected for a period of time, but at some stage when she was 21, she decided that she wanted to tell her story. Um, and uh, she was able to do that because it's only um, if you, I mean, a person can waive that uh, privacy. I also just want to flag that I'm only talking, and this law only talks about civil cases, not criminal matters. Those are separately dealt with in the Criminal Procedure Act. So this court doesn't have to decide about the protection of children in criminal proceedings. Sorry, this portfolio committee doesn't have to decide about um, criminal proceedings, only has to decide about um, civil cases that will, but what's important is that it must be protective at all levels of the court system. Um, or in the constitutional court. And um, as I have said, I've made recommendations in my written submissions 
um, and precisely how one would be able to do that. The next point that I'd like to move on to is the point of corporal punishment. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I argued the amicus curiae submissions in the Constitutional Court. I should perhaps just clarify. I argued on the side of the case that argued for um, the abolition of the defense of reasonable chastisement. In, in other words, I was in favor of um, corporal punishment being abolished. Um, and um, I think this is the the uh, this is what the constitutional court decided. The constitutional court decided that that special defense that parents had to say, well, I was undertaking reasonable chastisement must go, and that children um, must be protected from um, corporal punishment. So many organizations have made submissions to um, add the following in section 11. No child may be subjected to corporal punishment or be punished in a cruel, inhuman or degrading manner. And I support this suggestion because it merely reflects what the constitutional court has already said in the freedom of religion of South Africa case. I also think it's important to ensure that there are clear referral mechanisms for parents, for example, to parenting programs um, and to ensure that the state funds such programs. I just want to say that um, those of us who, who are um, in favor of corporal punishment being and um, do not want to see parents being criminalized. Um, what we want to see is that parents are, uh, that social workers and others can work with parents to ensure, um, you know, improved positive parenting practices. Now comes to the issue of guardianship. Um, and this relates to proposed amendments, to section 24 and section 45. Going back a little bit, when the original Children's Act came to Parliament, it was proposed that guardianship should be moved from the sole jurisdiction of the High Court so that magistrates' courts could also give guardian option, uh, orders. Unfortunately, that was not done at that time, which was a missed opportunity. Why is this important? It's important because Many children live um, with people who are not their legal guardians. It could be that they live with their grandmothers or their aunts, um, and um, th th that person may need guardianship. It's particularly acute where children are orphaned or abandoned, but it's not only relevant to them because of the fact that um, fathers of children also sometimes have to go to court to establish that they have guardianship. So if, if fathers are not married to the mother and they are not living with the mother at the time of the child's birth, then they may have to prove uh, to a court that they, are, that they are guardians. And at the moment, the only option a father has is to go to the high court. And that's expensive and difficult and, and, and often far away from where people are living. So every, every uh, magistrate has a children's court and that's closer to the people. So the idea was, why not allow the, the magistrates' courts to do guardianship orders um, when they are necessary? So the current bill proposes that children's courts, and that's at the magistrates' level, should be able to grant guardianship orders. This is a good proposal, and I support it. But I do want to point out that Clause 24, which amends Section 45, is problematic because it limits the children's court jurisdiction to guardianship of an orphaned or abandoned mm -hmm. child. The words orphaned or abandoned child is a problem. It should just say that the children's court has jurisdiction to do guardianship orders. Because if we keep those words an orphaned or abandoned child, this will block fathers of children and, and where those children are neither orphaned or abandoned um, but the fathers will then have to go to the high court. They will not be able to go to the children's court to get guardianship. And it will also stop a grandparent who's looking after a child to get guardianship if, for example, the mother of the child goes far away to get work and the granny who's looking after the child might need to get guardianship to make certain decisions. Um, the kinds of decisions that guardians have to make, for example, <clears throat> are to do with... Um, some medical decision making. So um, if it's surgery, if a child has to undergo an operation, it would be a guardian that decides that. 
um, if a, a child is going to be considered to be given up for adoption, a guardian has to decide that. If a child is going to move across our country's borders, a guardian has to involve, be involved in that. Any financial issues, the guardian has to be involved. So let's say that you know the, um, the grandmother is trying to resolve um, that the father's pension funds uh, or, or his uh, payout because he had a car accident or something like that. As soon as you get into anything like that, you actually need guardianship. And so, um, although it isn't, I wouldn't say there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that need guardianship. Um, it is very important and it can be one of the things that slows down processes. So the easier we can make it, um, the better. And I do believe that the Children's Court have the ability to make this assessment because Children's Courts do adoptions and adoptions are just as important and serious as making a decision about guardianship. Now to the comprehensive legal solution for foster care. The, you, just to recap, you'll remember that the foster care system was in danger of collapsing and around about 2011, um, the Center for Child Law brought a case to court uh, to argue um, that the system must be kept going um, and we could extend foster care orders just using an administrative process until such time as the department comes up with a comprehensive legal solution. Regrettably, that was 10 years ago, and um, we're still without that comprehensive legal solution, but I'm getting very positive that that aim and that end is close and that the Portfolio Committee will be able to deliver that comprehensive legal solution. So what is that about? Well, it's really about reducing the number of children who come into the foster care system. Because foster care is actually a specialized form of alternative care that requires social work oversight. It is very important for children who are in need of care and protection, who may have been abused or neglected, then you need a social worker involved. But there are many, many people caring for children in South Africa who are who, who don't abuse them, don't neglect them, but they, they need to be able to have their uh, their their role recognized and they need to have access to uh, grants to be able to assist. So um, currently the bill has clause 82, which amends section 150. It says a child who has been abandoned or orphaned and has no parent, guardian, family member or caregiver who is able and suitable to care for the child. Now, you'll see that those words in the middle that are in bold and in brackets, those are being deleted, of course. And um, why are they being deleted? Well, because in the past, the courts have found these words very difficult to interpret. So what were they? Does not have the ability to care for himself or herself, and such inability is readily apparent. The court said, well, you know, these are difficult things to interpret. Um, and we, we started to get ourselves into a very complicated legal situation. I, I think my concern about the draft as it currently stands is that the words who is able and suitable to care for a child is going to open up all those questions again through interpretation by the courts. Who's going to decide who is able? Who's going to decide who is suitable? And, um, you know, what does that actually mean? So it would be better to be more precise. So let me say, I don't object to the intention behind clause 82 that amends 150, but I think there's a better and clearer way of doing it. And that is to say, a child who has been abandoned or orphaned and is not in the care of a family member as defined in section one. And in blue there, I've just quickly put in um, how family member is defined in section one. And it's a pretty broad definition, but at least it is clear. You know, it's a list that anyone can go and check. Okay, so what does a family member mean? It's not open to interpretation. It's a parent or another person who has parental responsibilities, a grandparent, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, cousin, or any other person with whom the child has developed a significant relationship 
that D is perhaps a little vague and not so easy to interpret, but at least the first three are absolutely clear um, and it won't be difficult to determine. So why is all of this important? It's because section 150, which it aims to amend, lists the children who are in need of care and protection. These cases must be dealt with in the children's court and a social worker is allocated and many children coming through this process will be placed in foster care. So the reason we ended up with a foster care crisis is because too many children who were living with their extended family and were not really in need of care and protection were brought into the foster care system. So let me just go back to that previous slide. If we have this clause saying, remember the lead in sentences, a child is a child in need of care and protection if a child who has been abandoned or orphaned and is not in the care of a family member. That would mean that a child who's abandoned or orphaned is a child in need of care and protection. But a child who is abandoned or orphaned and is in the care of a family member is not a child in need of care and protection. Obviously not, because they're being looked after by someone from their family, which is the case for two million, uh, uh, several, you know, I don't know exactly the pr uh, precise numbers, but I'm sure it's been given to you by someone else, um, but over two million children in the country are being cared for by family members. They're not all in need of care and protection. So what this would mean is that we would reduce the number of children coming into the foster care system. That is already happening, actually. We are seeing that happening um, because of all the court cases and because of all the awareness of the problem, but it needs to continue until we have a manageable number of children, and then we will no longer have a foster care crisis. However, there is another piece to the comprehensive legal solution that needs to be considered. And that is that the care, why did the family members come into the foster care system in the first place that caused our crisis was because they wanted, they didn't want social workers to help them, but they knew that the grant for foster care was higher than the grant for the child support grant. Now, I'm not criticizing them for seeking additional cash. After all, they are caring for children who are not their biological children. And it's also a good option for the state to pay more because otherwise the, the state would be paying for these children to be in child and youth care centers, which is a much more expensive option and not good for children. So um, I understand why they need more money. So- um, You've got uh, you Okay, I'm nearly done. For this reason, the Social Assistance Act regulations were amended to allow for an additional payment to relatives caring for orphans and abandoned children. So that is the other piece of the puzzle that must happen. I have heard, Chair, that the current budget now does not cater for this additional amount for relatives who are caring for orphans and abandoned children. And I do hope that this portfolio committee can do something to make sure that this crucial part of the comprehensive legal solution falls into place. Um, Chair, I have added a um, one slide into my original site protection uh, PowerPoint, and this is my second to last slide. Um, it is the one dealing with the child protection register. The purpose of this register is to prevent people who Rob, have a history. Rob, yes, Chair. We said one minute to go. Okay. Uh, so do I have no minutes left? No, when I said one minute, it means it was going. But can you okay. two minutes to wrap up, please? Two minutes, yes. Okay. Yes. So mm -hmm. on this slide, Chair, all I am saying is um, the committee should consider that instead of having a child protection register, we should shift over to using the criminal record register, which is inexpensive and easy to access. And I would encourage you to discuss with your colleagues who are on the Justice Portfolio Committee, who are discussing exactly the same thing in relation to the National Register for Sex Offenders. And my last point, Chair, I will leave. It is about children going into um, CYCCs referred by the Child Justice Act. Um, I'm worried that the current draft 
cuts these children off, and this would be a very dangerous for them. Um, and I would just simply draw your attention, please, to the effects of Clause 87, amending Section 167. In my written submissions, I've explained why this is very concerning. Thank you for your patience, Chair, and thank you for listening. Thank you for the education. Thank you very much. Uh, it was quite assisting in terms of understanding the law better. Uh, the, the legislative intervention better. Thank you very much, Paul. Now we are going to engage until 10 past 11, or maybe I can say 12 past or 11 past 11. The, <clears throat> the inputs we are going to engage is Consortium for Refugees and Migrants in South Africa, Scala Bridge Center, Bridge, Door of Hope, and then, of course, the, the legal uh, intervention from the technical point of view by Prof. and Skilton. Uh, can I check hands on our members? Uh, in front of me is Honorable Fandamerva, Honorable. Open man and Honorable Alexander going. Honorable Masango going. 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 God. Up to Honorable Masango. Thank you. Honorable Fanamava. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. And, and once more, thank you very much to our presenters. Um, I, I wish to. I wish to start with Nadine from the Door of Hope, and I want to say to her, thank you very much for the amazing work that they continue to do as an organization. I think really they stand between life and death for many vulnerable children on a daily basis, and I also thank her for remembering baby Ezra. I think it was a very painful story, as, as you also said, Chairperson. And I think the, the story that Nadine once more underscores, and, and it keeps on coming out from all of the public he well, from the public hearings and everybody that is presented to us on adoption challenges, is really one of, of dreams and hopes and, and futures of, of vulnerable children being deferred due to a little piece of paperwork that never arrives on time. And I think it was very profound when Nadine said that, you know, an abandoned baby is abandoned twice because first they're abandoned by their parents and then abandoned by the system. In other words, by officials of the Department of Home Affairs and DSD who, who caused these delays in, in getting children into their forever homes. And I think you are right, Chair, once more that, you know, government can no longer be the obstacle to adoption. And therefore, I think we must really, um, you know, seriously look at the issue of time frames to be built into, led, into this amendment process so that we ensure that we hold to account officials who do not comply with the time frames that they're supposed to adhere to. So I would really like to make that appeal, appeal again. Um, I would like to ask Nadine if she can give us an, I, I, I believe that in previous years before adoption became such a, such a, a, a process uh, bogged down in, in delays and red tape, I believe that children were able to be adopted before or around the age of six months. Um, and I wanted to know, you know, if a child arrives um, to their centre currently, um, you know, what, what is the current age? So are children still able to be adopted by the age of six months or is it getting towards the age of one or two years? What is the average age of a child? Um, you know, that, so is it a one year, two years, three years? How long is it taking in terms of um, what is the average age of a child currently in their, in their homes? I wanted to ask uh, um, the referral pathways. How do children normally um, uh, get to the door of hope? Um, I, I also wanted to ask her, do, does she think that DSD understands their day-to-day -day challenges as an organization? Or does she also get the sense, which many, many have alluded to, about this general anti-adoption sentiment within mm. the department? Um, I also wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about the resources that is required on a monthly basis to run a children's home and what is the ratio of funds that they get from DSD. In other words, what, you know, if, if they need, for example, 5 million to run a children's home throughout the year, how much is, is, is provided for by DSD and how much do they have to source themselves? And considering that many NGOs are currently struggling with funding, 
how difficult is it to source these funds? Um, and I think I want to agree with her, you know, this issue of safe abandonment versus non-safe abandonment. Chairperson, her comments around the issue that this bill misses an opportunity to look at decriminalizing um, abandonment. So, so obviously what one finds is they've got these baby boxes, mothers are able to come and leave their children safely, but because they face being prosecuted for doing that, um, they'd rather choose unsafe abandonment. And we need to look at the issue of safe haven laws because they do exist in other parts of the world. And we need to maybe look at this amendment process and see how do we um, safeguard the rights of mothers who want to abandon their babies safely, not, not encouraging abandonment, but we need to obviously make it safe. Okay, Chairperson, I'm almost done. And then to the Consortium of Refugees and the Scalabrini Center, I think the inputs that they made in terms of uh, the rights of undocumented migrant children and children who are stateless. I, I do serve on the Portfolio Committee of Home Affairs, and I did see in the APP that there are moves afoot uh, to regularize the documentation of children that are born to undocumented migrants um, or even stateless children. So I think um, there are moves afoot to correct that. But I also wanted to ask them whether any of them have been involved with any work around the refugees that are based at Payne City and... Um, uh, uh, Maitland, because I believe many yes. of those children have not yes. gone to school yet. Thank you. to share for everything. All Thank of you. Us. Thank you, Chairperson. I have a quest two questions for Doors of Hope and two for Breach. I want to know from Doors of Hope, you say 3,500 children are annually abandoned. I want to know, do you have an estimate of how many more babies were abandoned since lockdown in the country. And then I'd like to know, I'm fairly new in DSD, so I'd like to know what currently prevents baby boxes to be legalized in South Africa? Or why is it illegal? And how do we go about it with the bill before us now to remove the sanction attached to safer relinquishment of babies? And then to breach, you say that the majority of black women own ECDs. So indirectly, DSD NPO policies are further disadvantaging black women. Do you perhaps have a percentage of how many black women are hindered by these NPO policies? And you say also some facilities charge 30 to 40 rand to accommodate poorer communities. Yet the lower the fee, the less you can upgrade infrastructurally and the lower the quality of the ECD services. So are you saying in order to accommodate the poor, a result is substandard ECD services, which in turn prevents the center to get assistance through subsidy from DSD? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Opperman. I wish Thank everyone can learn from you. Honorable, Alexander. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to all the organizations for the presentations. I would just like to find out from um, um, Scalabrini, I know you may not have the number offhand, but just children in your care that are in the same position as Asher, what is that number um, in your organization like currently? How many children are in the same position as Asher? And then also to Professor Skelton, um, the slide um, was a new slide in our presentation with regards to the criminal register and the child protection register. Um, what other aspects do you see um, the criminal the criminal register? Um, how would it benefit children using the criminal register um, and moving away um, from the national the, the child protection register? Um, I hope I'm clear about that. Like, how else can it benefit children using um, the criminal register apart from it just being cheaper? Thank you, Chair. Dan? Hello? Honorable Alexander, are you done? Yes. Cheers, Thank you. Sir. Okay, Honorable Masango. Thank you, Chair. I also just thank you for the opportunity to engage and thank you to the presenters. 
for um, again very very um, uh, insightful presentations and informative. Um, my questions have been asked, most of them. So I will ask just the one question from uh, uh, the consortium. Um, are there instances that you have come across uh, situations where practitioners who who work with children don't possess the right certificates or they are not accredited with the, the relevant professional bodies? I'm saying that because uh, that was one of the issues that uh, the consortium uh, um, raised in their presentation. And the next question is um, the the. Uh, the issue about the rapid, um, the rapid unific reunification, um, the, the, the how long is a, a reunification it, uh, that should happen? I mean, how long should it, 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 it take for a proper reunification to happen from the, the time that the, the, the family uh, and the, the children's home starts, you know, uh, engaging on, on reunifying a child that has been in a children's home or, yeah, or, or in an institution. And also, the, this, was from, this was from Nadine. Uh, and for me, it was, uh, it was also very, uh, you know, uh, interesting to hear that not only are the adoptions delayed, but the, even the reunification of, of families that themselves come up to say, we want to reunify uh, those that, um, you know, are ready to unify with their children. So I would just like to know that that uh, time. And the last one goes to, to, to Prof. Uh, the the fact that the 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 law the the act ah. says or the bill says that a, a child um, the fact that this is the child that we're talking about it should mean that they are not able to care for themselves oh. or they are not suitable to care for themselves so uh, without it uh, just confusing and and leading to a lot of uh, uh, in uh, interpretations by the courts and, and other players, should it not just not have been there in the first place? Because I heard that the prof said that she was part of the, um, of the, of the bill or was consulted during mm -hmm. the drafting of the bill. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, can presenters who are affected by the comments Make a response of not more than three minutes, please, in the order. But please make a comment if your presentation has been referred to. Chairperson, can you allow me to just ask one question? No. No. No, Honorable No. Okay. No. I mean, I called Honorable Members. Okay, do it, but I don't think we should do it going forward. Yes. Proceed. Thank you, I'm sorry for that. I just want to ask from Prof one question. In terms of when a child is under the father through the court, maybe the mother was having some challenges of anxiety and depression. Uh, what is the process to reunify the child with the mother? And how long does it take? Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Can we start with the consortium? If there was any comment, if nothing referred to your presentation, you don't have to. I can start. It's Nadine from Door of Hope. Is that uh, Nadine? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Honorable Fandamara, I will ask um, answer your uh, questions first. With regards to your first question, the ages of the babies um, now compared to a few years ago with regards to adoption, 
generally um, the ages were around between six to nine months that our babies got adopted. It has now gone up generally between nine and 18 months, but in some cases, even up to the ages of two years old. Uh, with regards to your questions of how babies come to us, um, with it's either mainly through uh, hospitals, the police and mommies or families that come to our door. With regards to our day-to-day -day operations, um, do we think that DSD officials understand it? I don't think so. I, I often get the impression that um, to the department, it's just a name on a piece of paper. A door of hope, it's an actual little human being. It's an actual person who we see starts to smile, starts to take, crawl, starts to take their first steps. It's a little baby that is growing into a, um, a little toddler. And sometimes it does, we get the impression that um, the, the department does not understand this. It's, a, it's either a name or just a number. And often we feel like the best interest of the child is not considered in some of the decisions. Um, our day-to-day -day resources, uh, to give you an idea, we have 65 babies in our care at this moment. We use between 12 and 15,000 nappies a month. We use around 100 tons of formula and 400 to 500 bottles of purity or baby cereal. The DSD ratio, um, that uh, funding that we get, to give you an idea, if our annual turnover to look after our babies um, is around 10 million rand per annum, we only get about 2.8 million rand from the department. The rest we have to fundraise. And in some cases, uh, to, to fundraise, you have to spend a bit of money. And this is very difficult to us because we have to keep our money to pay to buy food and nappies for for our babies um but the saying goes you have to spend money to make money but we do rely a lot on social media um to advertise our needs um and to reach out to people to to see if they can help us just with our basic needs to care for the for our babies with regards to safe haven laws in south africa we do not have safe haven laws we desperately desperately need safe haven laws um, I honestly think that unsafe abandonment will reduce if South Africa has safe haven laws. And um, to go back to Honourable, um, I think it was, yes, Honourable Opperman, um, I mentioned about three and a half thousand babies are um, abandoned annually. Those are stats that were officially done in 2010. Unfortunately, we do not have annual stats that is done by um, Stats SA or done by government, as far as I know. Abandonment um, category actually forms part of another uh, criminal statistic, uh, which I think also includes abuse and neglect. So it's very difficult to say how many children are actually abandoned every year because a lot of them are also abandoned in rural areas in rubbish dumps where they are most probably never found. The facts that we have is what we see in social, um, on the news, share with other homes. Um, the safe haven laws, I mentioned the baby box is illegal. It is not written anywhere that it is illegal, but because we have no safe haven laws, any form of abandonment is illegal, whether it is safe or unsafe. So a mommy that abandons her baby in hospital can be arrested for, for abandoning a baby. So if we make baby boxes legal um, and then after that implement safe haven laws, um, no mom should uh, have any, feel threatened to leave her baby in a hospital or a police station because at the end of the day, she's saving the life of that baby and not leaving it somewhere to die. Um, Honorable Masango, with regards to reunification, we've had volunteers that came to Door of Hope that had to apply for a Form 30 to check if their name was on the um, sex offenders register. Yeah. Some of them got them in one day. I'm almost done. Sorry, Nadine. 
Yes. Let's share the, let's share the time with others. Okay. Okay. Um, this was my last my last question, so I think I'm done. But reunification should not take long at all. Thank you very much, Nadine. Thank you, thank you. For the emotional moment you've shared with us. Any other one wanting to comment? Um, this is Sally Gander here from the Scalabrini Center. And I'm just providing... My, 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 my children in my great daddy. Yes. <laughs> thanks, 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 Sally. Um, I'm, I'm giving answers to Honorable Fanda Merva and Honorable Abrahams. Um, Honorable Van Remover, just in regards to the refugees, asylum seekers, migrants at Penn City and Wingfield, I didn't hear the, the whole of your question, but um, services have been provided by our welfare department and our advocacy departments to uh, those who have sought our services from those groups. Um, I do know that Adonis Mosati, as well as UCT Refugee Rights Unit, have also provided services uh, in respect of uh, those those groups. There are some members of those groups, though, that have not um, wanted or tried to access our services. Um, and then thank you for the information regarding the regularization of documentation. Um, if I may, I would like to engage more on that, but perhaps over email it would be better. Uh, with regard to the question from Honorable Abrahams uh, around the number in our CYCC, um, so as I mentioned, Lawrence House, which specifically uh, focuses on children from migratory backgrounds, um, we have 25 or up to 25 children in that CYCC, but um, there are many more CYCCs across the Cape Metro, uh, the Western Cape and South Africa. And um, just this year alone, our advocacy children's rights project has uh, consulted uh, on 40 cases so far uh, regarding the documentation needs of children who have been deemed in need of care and protection and placed in CYCCs. I do also want to highlight that there is not only the issue for the children who are in CYCCs and don't have access to documentation and immigration status, there is also a growing category of children who have aged out They've, uh, so they're young adults now, they've left the care system, they are out of the CYCC system, but they still do not have documentation or immigration status, and they don't have roots to documentation and immigration status. And we're seeing a growing group of, of those young adults. Um, and then lastly, the Scalabrini Center was involved in research in both 2015 and 2017, where we looked at the issue of children in um, care who didn't have access to documentation or who had limited pathways to documentation and immigration status. And in 2015, our surveys in the Western Cape came up with, the figure was 109 children in the Western Cape alone. Um, in 2017, we had a number of 200 across three provinces. That was Limpopo, Gauteng, and the Western Cape. Um, we are aware that that was, I mean, we're an NGO and um, we had staff driving from CYCC to CYCC in various provinces and we have limited capacity. So there could be some gaps uh, to that research, which may point to higher numbers than the ones that we have. I'd be very happy to share that research with the portfolio committee. Um, it shows, yeah, just that 40% um, of the children that uh, we were aware of had no documentation at all. 27% were at high risk of statelessness. I am also aware that the Department of Social Development together with UNICEF has at the beginning of this year done uh, an audit uh, across CYCCs, I think nationally, uh, where they are trying to understand exactly how many children fall into these categories. And so um, we haven't seen the results of that audit yet, but um, I encourage the portfolio committee to ask the department. Um, I'm sure that they will willingly provide that information and it will give more of a picture as to, to the numbers, which we believe are uh, quite high and could easily okay. be through the, the solutions we proposed.
Thank you, Chair. Okay, Sally. Uh, Ramsey, anything on your side? Um, yes, Chair. I would just like to respond to, I think it was Honorable Opperman's question around the numbers that we're dealing with um, in terms of um, the women who are disadvantaged in the provision of ECD services. Um, so, Honorable Opperman, um, from a recent presentation by the Department of Social Development to the Intersectoral Forum on the Presidential ECD Stimulus, I have numbers that are reported here that there's around 164,000 ECD, ECD workers who are in um, unsubsidized programs. So um, I think what we can generally deduce as the sector is that majority of these workers are women. Um, and just to answer your question around barriers with NPO registration, I mean, ECD provision is generally provided through NPOs as well as um, subsistence entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. So to the extent to which NPO registration is a barrier, I'm not entirely sure. The point that I was trying to make in my presentation is that the registration of ECD programs as well as partial care facilities remains the biggest barrier for um, ECD services to gain the full registration required by the department municipalities um, so that they can actually then um, be eligible for the subsidy. The second question, I'm I'm, I'm not sure that I understood it correctly, and I would just kindly like to request if maybe Honorable Upperman could repeat the question because I, I missed it, Chair. Well, uh, for now, let's go to <laughs> Prof. Ann Skelton. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the first question by Honorable Abrahams related to the criminal uh, record system, and she asked, what would be the benefits for children? Well, I think besides the fact that the whole system would work more smoothly, um, it would mean that staff would not be appointed without having been checked against the register, which is sometimes happening on a temporary basis because the register process is too slow. Secondly, um, it also means that when the staff look at the criminal record, you know, when the person who's doing the appointing, the employer, looks at the criminal record system, what they see there is every single criminal offense that that person might have committed. When you look at the register, it's a limited number of cases. It's where a person might have assaulted a child um, in the past. But wouldn't one want to know that this person has assaulted adults in the past? Wouldn't one want to know that this person has been convicted um, of raping an adult? Wouldn't one want to know that this person um, has convictions for drunken driving? Now, if you use the criminal record system, which is already there, already functional, nothing needs to be spent on it, um, you would have all that information immediately. So I would say that would be a benefit for children because it would provide broader and greater protection for them. Um, the second question was by Honorable Masango. Um, she says, well, this, uh, the changes to section 150 that are open to interpretation, why did that get into the bill in the first place? As you may know, um, honorable members, there were various versions of this bill. And I think you will have heard from other civil society partners that we were very satisfied with many aspects of the July 2018 version of the bill, which was the version that was consulted on and that I was involved with. After that, the bill disappeared into the department and something happened. And all kinds of changes were made, many of which um, are the substance of our concerns. So um, I would say that, it, that what we have proposed there uh, goes back to um, the conceptualization after July 2018, which was the department's bill, but it was the bill that civil society also agreed with. Um, and uh, that is why, um, even though I was involved in drafting the bill, as I said, um, I don't agree with the current formulation, but I did agree with the previous formulation in the prior version. Um, then Honorable Nvana asked a question relating to guardianship and fathers and what happens if a mother has temporarily really handed over care. So um, actually it's important to distinguish between guardianship and care, because guardianship is un, unconnected care. Every child who is born in a marriage has two guardians, 
a mother and a father. And if they get divorced, those guardians are still the guardians of the child, even though the child may live with one person. So guardianship isn't affected by where the child lives. Um, so therefore, what is being asked really here by Honorable Mbana is, if a child was placed in the care of a father, how would one go to getting back? And the answer to that is that that is possible to do through the children's court. Um, I think that the children's court would be able to deal with a case like that um, to, in order to restore the child back to the mother's care if that is in the best interest of the child at that time. Um, how long it would take, it's hard to say, but I think it would require probably several months of engagement at the, at the children's court. But the advantage of the children's court and why we want guardianship to be at the children's court is that it is generally quicker than doing things at the high court where the court roles are more crowded and things take longer. So those are my responses, Chair. Thanks and back to Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we are done. Uh, can I express on behalf of the Portfolio Committee that cooperation with all Thank the presenters you, uh? My my sincere apology. Did the consortium come in? No, they didn't. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, maybe you can follow up with some text or whatever. I don't know. Because remember, I said he's uh, preparing for the funeral. That's what he, that, that, that's what he said. Okay, Ufu, no. Yeah. Um, honorable members, let us move when we can. Uh, can I assume, Lindy, that Montana is here? The Bishops' Conference is here, Cotlands is here, Trinity is here, Foundation Trust is here. Uh, yes, Chair. The only person that indicated that she he had experiencing um technical challenges is um. Mr. Montlan, I've been trying to get hold of him. Uh, I couldn't, and even on his cell phone, he's not here yet. I'm worried about that because Montlana is a great leader of Mozambique. Mm -hmm. And when my mother wanted me to be called Montlana, they decided to call me Montl. So I've got a connection with that name. I'm but trying to get him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so in the meantime, uh, Miss Louise Law, can she take the platform from the Catholic Bishops Conference? Miss Law. Uh, she's uh, here, Chair. I can see, I can see the presentation is is being, is take is is getting on. Take the platform, Ms. Law, and uh, your, of oh, please switch on your camera. Is the camera on? It's not on. I don't see you. Can you not see me? No, we don't. Can you see me now? Uh, maybe others do see. I don't. We can see her. You chair. should be able to see her, chair. They can see you. Yes, Jim. Oh, that's a problem. Um, uh, no, it's fine. If they see you, proceed. <laughs> if they see you, proceed. <laughs> um, Chairperson, honorable members. Um, the, the South African Catholic Bishops Conference Parliamentary Liaison Office welcomes this opportunity to comment on the Children's Amendment Bill. We have commented on the Children's Act at every opportunity in past years, as we see it as fundamental to the proper realization of the Constitution and Section 28 of the Bill of Rights. Our children deserve a childhood that is free from want, that is safe, protected, healthy, and fun, and where each child is cherished, nurtured, and respected. The successful impl implementation of the Act must be subject to ongoing evaluation and necessary improvements should be introduced if the need arises. It is our hope that these amendments will result in legislative changes that are in the best interests of the child. 
both the recent public hearings on the gender-based violence bills and these public hearings on the Children's Amendment Bill come at a particularly important juncture in the history of our country. The shadow pandemic of violence against women and children has been starkly revealed in a way that is no longer possible to ignore. The church has always had the opportunity duty of scrutinizing the times of the, the signs of the times and of interpreting them in the light of the gospel. This is one of our guiding principles. The other guiding principle is that of the best interests of the child. It is important to note that this is in the singular. So the focus must always be on what is the interest of the particular child concerned. And Sally and Cindy spoke very eloquently to that this morning. Archbishop Silvano Tomasi, who was the former Vatican envoy to the UN, commented, if respect for the human rights of children measures the health of a society, then the legal recognition of these rights is urgent. The first right of children is that of being born and educated in a welcoming and secure family environment where their physical, psychological, and spiritual growth is guaranteed, their potential is developed, and where the awareness of personal dignity becomes the base for relating to others and for confronting the future. It has never been more important to be, consequent, to be cognizant of what kind of children we are growing. An emphasis on positive parenting and family strengthening and family preservation has never been more significant. We have a few comments on the definitions. We welcome the expanded definition of an abandoned child, which is more inclusive and comprehensive. We support the inclusion of aftercare provided to adoptive families in the definitions of, of adoption services. Adoption constitutes the permanent placement of a child with an adoptive family. Hitherto, adopting families have had, had, had very little aftercare and support. Furthermore, there is no, furthermore, there's not usually any further monitoring of the placement. So aftercare is, is really important. Um, we welcome the definition of both early childhood development center and early childhood development service, and particularly note the assistance and support to be given to parents the recent past has seen a pandemic of violence against women and children. ECD centres should be well placed to provide support, advice and referrals. Unfortunately, ECD centres were closed for much of the lockdown. Private ECD centres were able to re reopen as the lockdown restrictions eased, but many did not have the means to reopen and receive no state support. We note that the bill devotes much attention to ECD, but plans for the Department of Basic Educate, Education to take over the responsibility for, for ECD from the Department of Social Development are proceeding. ECD has been a constituent element of the Children's Act, and the motivation for moving into the Department of Basic Education has not always been clearly motivated, particularly in the case of infants and children under the age of three. Um, we also note that the definition for, of genital mutilation has been posited in the bill and has not really been clear what the implications of that is. Um, we know uh, it's clearly uh, with, with regard to girl children. We know clause six, um, which is an amendment of section 12, that a girl child must not be given after in marriage before she obtains the age of majority and that female genital mutilation is prohibited. Too often girl children are regarded as a commodity and these stricter amendments afford them greater protection. Um, clause three, children's right to privacy and protection of information. The inclusion of various pieces of existing legislation to protect the privacy of information about a child is very important in a society where crimes against children are commonplace. Furthermore, we live in a digital age where social media generates information about children that is very easily accessed. Um, clause seven, children with disabilities. We welcome the change in terminology from disabled children to children with disabilities. Children with special needs should not be defined by their disability. Furthermore, every effort must be made to ensure that they have appropriate assistive devices which facilitate their, their participation in society. In a society as unequal as ours, the needs of these children are easily overlooked. Clause 10, the rights of unmarried fathers. The rights of unmarried fathers are extended and a certificate confirming that the biological father has automatically acquired 
for parental rights, rights and responsibilities can be issued. Co-parenting is important and research increasingly shows that fathers play a significant role in the lives of their children, whether by their presence or by their absence. Should the relationship between the respective parents break down, the matter must be referred for mediation. Clause 12, the children's view, the child's view. We support this amendment, which allows the voice of the child to be heard where possible. Child participation is one of the underlying principles of the Children's Act. So this amendment is to be welcomed. Too often the agency of children is overlooked. Um, clauses 45, 46 and 47 pertaining to early childhood development programs. These amendments are welcome. However, we have serious concerns regarding the provision of ECD services and fundings thereof, the impact of COVID-19 on these services and programs, as well as the failure of so some, some many of these centers to reopen as lockdown restrictions were eased is, concern, is of concern for us. Um, we know that the migration of ECG from the Department of Social Development to the Department of Basic Education is proceeding, but have concerns about the Department of Basic Education's administrative capacity for um, funding for social workers, the impact, the registration of ECD centers, training of unqualified ECD practitioners, the budget for migration of practitioners, the, the conversion from a stipend to a salary, um, the registration and the inaccessibility of ECD centers in rural areas. And many of these challenges have bedeviled the ECD pro project since its inception. Um, the intersectorial aspects of the act, um, all departments and institutions involved have cooperated in this endeavor. The intersectorial aspects of the act are one of its greatest innovations, but it's also been one of its greatest disappointments with full buy-in from other departments. Both section 97 and section 147 require consultation with other departments and stakeholders. Hopefully this will result in greater consultation and cooperation with other departments. The constitutional entitlements of children require this. The signs of the times are telling us that everybody has to participate to ensure the well-being of our children. Um, part um, clause 65, part B of a national child protection register, persons un unsuitable to work with children. During the recent public hearings on the gender-based violence bill, it emerged that neither the National Register for Sex Offenders nor the Domestic Violence Register were being properly maintained, which rendered them ineffectual and provided the vulnerable with little protection. The same can be said for Part B of the National Child Protection Register. It was suggested that instead of continuing to maintain registers which appear both man manageable and effectively useful, useless, it would be sensible to make use of the one record that is already operational and frequently updated, and that is the criminal record. A criminal record check will indicate all convictions when an individual has been found guilty of an offence against a child and is consequently unsuitable to work with children. At present, the criminal record check is the one, is the one of the vital requirements in the South African business and employee recruitment industry. It appears to be the only register that is regularly updated and operated efficiently. Um, clause 77 XF, the care of abandoned children. The number of abandoned children has increased considerably during the lockdown and there have been many fatalities. Child abandonment is an act of desperation by a birth mother who has no support. They are clearly not enough or sufficiently advertised support services for children and women in crisis pregnancies. There are some same services, which Nadine spoke about this morning so very, very movingly, which have a place for a newborn baby who may be placed anonymously, but they are not nearly enough. There's a tendency to vilify mothers who have their babies, while they may be desperate or may have run out of options. Rather than be criminally charged with the concealment of a birth or abandonment of a child, these mothers could be provided with viable options in a non-judgmental manner. 
the criminal justice system should not be involved as a last resort if the intervention of social services are unsuccessful and there's clear evidence of abuse or neglect. And clause 68 to 94, foster care. This book seeks to provide a workable solution to the challenges, challenges faced in the foster care system. Foster care has always played an important part in the continuum of care services for children in need of alternative care. When foster care is administered appropriate, appropriately with the proper mechanisms and structures, it allows children to remain in a loving and caring family, while authorities work towards family reintegration and permanent placements and permanent alternatives. Foster care can be used for a wide range of children, including those leaving institutional care in emergency contexts and for children who aren't, would otherwise be on the streets. Foster care may provide some children with a longer term home in cases when in cases where neither return to home or adoption is in the child's best interests. However, the HIV AIDS pandemic and the widespread orphanhood of so many children meant that many children were placed in kinship foster care. And as others have spoken of beforehand, this resulted in, in a huge backlog in foster care placements, um, they, which, which has meant that that child protection social workers and courts have become overburdened and children who desperately require the services of a foster care social worker because they have been subject to abuse, neglect and abandonment have not had the, have, have, have not had access to serve services timelessly. Also, there are a limited number of social workers can actually render these services because they are so, so involved in the black backlog of, in the court backlog. Social workers are required to make immensely important decisions regarding the care and protection of vulnerable children. This process takes time, patience and resources. There is a chronic shortage of social workers, but not all social work graduates who receive bursaries from the Department of Social Development are employed. Social workers enter the profession, entering the profession also need proper supervision from more senior social workers. While the amendment of Section 159 of the Act makes provision for a court to issue an interim order during whose duration will not exceed six months is to be welcomed. It can only make the necessary difference if enough staff and resources are deployed. Um, clause 117, which deals with adoption. A child parent must be assisted by either his parents, either her parents, her guardian or a court in a decision to get the child for adoption. This is to be welcomed as a child parent needs to have various options available to her and explain to her so she can make an informed decision. However, in the absence of a trusted parent or guardian, this role could be assigned to a court. Child parents may not have disclosed the pregnancy, so there might need to be an intervention of a social worker or medical practitioner. It is important to be cognizant that the infant might be a result of a rape. The child parent's circumstances should be subject of a social work investigation. Some of the suggested amendments to the Act regarding adoption of, are among the most controversial of those proposed in this bill. The deleting of Section 249, Clause 122, essentially removes any reference to costs and fees associated with adoption services. Furthermore, State social workers are added to the list of persons that any social worker can act as an adoption social worker. This is problematic since adoption is a highly specialized field of social work. And until now, adoptions have always been the purview of specialized adoption social workers. Um, aftercare services may be performed by social workers and by social auxiliary workers as well. The provision of these amendments make it very difficult for social workers in private practice to continue to practice. It is unlikely that these specialized social workers will be absorbed into DSD programs. They are an important resource and will be used 
and, sh and should be used in the supervision of less experienced social workers. Adoption services defined in the present act remain unchanged and include the counselling of the parent of the child and where applicable the child, an assessment of a child by an adoption social worker, the gathering of information for proposed adoptions, the writing of court reports and medical and psychological assessments, and the adoption related tasks and potential costs include home visits, appointments as relevant professionals, court appearances, birth registrations, legal services, support services, child medical assessments and blood tests. All these tasks are immensely time consuming. It is clear from the above that the adoption pro pro process requires the services of highly skilled and experienced social workers who play a specialist role in the selection and matching of adoptive parents and adoptable children. The complexity of the adoption process requires the counselling of by birth parents as well as detailed assessments of adoptive parents. Extending this role to all social workers places an additional burden on social workers who already have extremely high close place loads. This cannot be regarded as being in the best interest of the child. While concerns regarding adoption costs may be valid, simply doing away with these fees will not solve the problem. It will only increase the burden on state social workers and will inevitably slow the whole process. Some form of regulation of fees may be needed or sliding scale could be used to make professional adoption services available to people with low income. In addition, children... Oh. Um, nearly finished. Okay. In, addition, in addition, children in successful long-term foster placements would be adopted if there was an adoption grant. I would like to conclude with a quote from Donald Dunstan, a Catholic priest and child activist, who said, in the faces of our children, we are given the best depths of, of humanity's future, a preview of the world to come. That is why the is can be no moral issue more unifying, more urgent, or more universal than nurturing their well-being and securing their chance to embrace the life our Creator destined for them. I thank you. Wow. Bye, thank you, thank you, Ms. Law. Uh, thank you. Put, uh, we'll be engaging with you after other three or four presentations. If, if you can stay around. Uh, Monjan. Where is Monjan? He's here, chair. Um, he's inside the meeting. Maybe he's got technical glitch. I don't know. Can you take the stage? his cell phone just to check if because he's not audible but he's inside the meeting um, can you hear me now yes mr montana yes mr montana yes. yes take your 20 minutes uh proceed uh greetings to everybody who's attending this important meeting um it's it's my pleasure to be part of it because in 2020, 2020, February, I was at the DSD on a hunger strike, 11 days, 11 nights hunger strike, unattended, um, just to, to be able to be assisted to get access to my children after the death of their mother. Uh, I'm, 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 I was shocked that it could take 11 days, neglected, while the minister could see me through his her window uh, down on the pavement. Nevertheless, uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not uh, 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 someone who knows how the law is drafted. But I'll just present what I wish I could. I could see and the experience that we are having as fathers in the main, in the most, in South Africa. I know also mothers are affected by this. Uh, the Children's Act of 2005 uh, categorizes biological fathers as unmarried and married. Uh, there is a problem with that. Unmarried fathers means a father is labeled different from the other biological parent of the same child. Unmarried fathers must satisfy certain super magical image above 
that of the other parent of the same child to assume his God-given parental rights and responsibilities on his own child. This kind of discrimination does not apply to unmarried mothers. It doesn't apply to unmarried mothers. Nothing said about unmarried mothers. This is gender bias at its best. This, is, this invites vultures who see an opportunity to use children as a tool to enrich themselves, placing the burden on the father while violating the rights of a child and abusing the taxpayer's money and or government resources. Opportunists are mothers, maternal grandparents, social workers, lawyers, psychologists, NPOs like CMR of the Dutch Republic. Sorry? I hope I don't, I'm not disturbing you in the moment. for the next five minutes. Uh, Chairperson, I've muted everyone. Uh, uh, Mr. Mundlana okay. can unmute himself and yeah, himself. All right. Thank you. Mundlana, please proceed. Uh, I, I just want to say you may, certain mothers may be opportunists, but to say all mothers, maybe you can remodel your language. Proceed. <laughs> okay. Proceed, Mundlana. Sorry about that interruption. Hey, where is Montana Mash? Can you hear me? We need, yes, we need we need that fire. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. The Children's Act must first and foremost redefine the term in the best interest of a child. This term has been misused by a network of corrupt social workers, corrupt NPOs, corrupt magistrates, corrupt institutions, and corrupt lawyers to serve their own interests. Whereas one parent, a father in the most, out of the two suffers and the child, and the child or children become victims. Now, what is currently ha happening in South Africa mainly violate mainly the rights of a child connected to a father. It's four years now, it's four years now without uh, seeing my children, especially the eldest child of mine after the, the mother died. The act must make it clear that a child is born by two parents. This should be taken into consideration before social workers label one innocent parent, a father in the main as violent abusive, unemployed, mentally ill, flight risk. Imagine I'm, 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 I'm labeled a flight risk just because my mother is closer, my father is Mozambican, I was born in Swaziland. And for that reason, uh, the law says I, I, sh I shouldn't be with my children. I must be investigated. Just being born by two, foreign, two, 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 uh, two different people who belong to two different countries in a foreign land, I'm a flight risk. How can a father or a parent be a flight risk to his own children? It really doesn't make sense at all. It's, it's, it's just an insult to, to, to a parent and to a child. Now, if we take into consideration that a child is born by two children, it should be a 50-50 shared parenting. What qualifies both of you, mother and father, as a, for shared uh, equal parenting is your 50 50 percent shared DNA that takes that makes up a, a complete human being being a child? Remove all the complications that seeks to undermine one parent and makes the other more of a parent than the other. You see, once there are, there, there are loopholes in the law, it invites, it invites corruption. People see an opportunity. To, to, to make money and using children as, as a tool of making money. Allegations and, and or accusations brought by one partner or extended family members during divorce or separation or during the death of one, on, of one partner must be investigated by the South African police services, not social workers. Social workers were not trained to investigate serious 
accusation brought against one parent. This is very serious. Normally, social workers use fabricated information to push one parent, a father in the most, from having access to his child or children. Most of these allegations are serious and they are unfounded. You, there is no truth in those allegations. In most cases, social workers just believe what they are told and they sympathize with the mother in most cases. Social workers must operate within the law. They shouldn't be biased and they must, and they must be transparent at all times. Social workers must produce a warrant of some sort to acquire information from parents. Imagine in my house was, was investigated by more than 11, 11 social workers who came in and out of my houses. And I, could, I didn't know who was right, who was real, who was, and they all wanted to see every bedroom, everything that was happening in my house. And that's an abuse of a human being in a democratic South Africa. Social workers must at all times respect one, one's privacy. They shouldn't invade our spaces like they, current, they are currently doing. Social workers must always make copies of their reports available to parties. You know, they always hide their, their reports. I had to fight for my reports in court against a social worker who didn't want me to see what is written about me, the, the, the rightful father of a child. They didn't want me to see that. And when I saw the report, I realized that the information which was there is in favor of me, but their behavior, the way they act is against me. Because of this gender, they always side with maternal parents. Imagine the mother of my children has long passed on. I was supposed to have full custard of my children without fighting with the grandmothers. And the grandmothers, were the grandparents were supposed to apply to have access to my children, which I was not going to deny. Because in our African culture, whether I'm from Mozambique, whether I'm from Eastern, uh, 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 whether I'm from Eastern Cape or I'm from Swaziland, it, our culture say we, we have been doing this almost all these years, that the children can stay with the grandparents. But they must do it in the right way, not in an illegal way, because now I hear that they want to, 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 to acquire f a, a, a right to be foster parents and apply for grants which, which they will be able to support themselves. Which, and, I, and you can ask yourself, I'm alive. How do you become a foster parent when a father is there, is alive, and is willing and wants his children? Social workers must be investigated by SEPs whenever an accusation is brought against them. I've been shouting in the media everywhere that CMR social workers uh, are corrupt. No one is entertaining me. But wrong accusation against me, everybody stands up. Because who, is the, who is a CMR social worker? Uh, Miss Haneli Swartz. I have been saying she must be. She must be investigated. And I've been questioning. I've been questioning the involvement of the Dutch Reformed Church in the lives of our children. In a democratic country like South Africa, how can we have an apartheid institution running the operations of our children? The, 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 the church that has been violating the rights of people for many years, today it's given funding by the Department of Social Development to, 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 to destroy our, the lives of, of our families and children. Grandparents, or relatives from both the maternal and paternal side should be treated equally. They should be treated as second option to be considered whenever the couples do not meet all the expected requirements. For example, if myself and the mother of the children do not agree and we're having a fight and the child suffers, then they can consider the grandparents. But not when a father is there, like in my case, the mother is dead. And you, you, you rush to, to give a, a, a first preference to the grandparents instead of the father who's willing to support and be with his children. That's not, you cannot remove a child just because the father is poor or lives in rural areas. That's not a good enough reason to take a child from a parent. It should be something that has to do with abuse. If you have never ab abused your children, you have never abused a, a, a child, why should you be considered an abusive person because you haven't done anything to any human being wrong? In case of, of the death of one parent, the child must 
must automatically remain with the other parent unless that parent is found to have abused the child and there is evidence. This must happen to both married and unmarried couples. Actually, this married and unmarried words need to be removed. We're just parents. Whether you're married or not married, we're all parents of the child. Whoever came with this unmarried and married, really, that person need also to be taken for, psychotic, for, for clinical assessment. Because really, how do you, to, to, do you define a, a, a parent to unmarried and married? Because when, when people uh, decide to make a child, they are, they are either married or unmarried. So you cannot describe a person by the status of being married or not married. The child's voice in our act, should it, the act should make it clear that the child's voice should always come first. Listen to a child. What is the child saying? Currently, my boy is telling the social workers that I need my father. This is the child that was told that I'm a stepfather. But when social workers came, he, he told the social workers that that's my father. Unfortunately, he doesn't know that the mother passed on. He told the social workers that I need my father and my mother. We used to stay with them. Three years later, he still remembers his father. The biological parent's voice should always be equally considered second to the voice of a child. Relatives and grandparents from both families of the couple should always equally be considered third. Stop making maternal relatives, especially grandparents, superhuman beings in custody battles. They must know their position. Social workers should always consider the facts. They must follow events and investigate and get all proofs. I'm disappointed by the, the family, the chief family advocate. She's handling, she's handling my case now. Instead of following the events from the, the, the year 2017 to now, she just sent an email which insulted the, the, my, my, myself and my whole family who, who got angry about the response. Uh, and she just said, I must be taken for clinical assessment without any reason. I've never been with these children for four years. And the whole family member stood up and said, you know what? The chief advocate is insulting us because we are quiet. Is it because we are called flight risk by the minister, Lindwezul? Is that the reason? Because we are foreigners. The word that have been used, that they are queries, is that the reason why they can take somebody's children? And because the people are just quiet and respecting the law. When we took this case to court, we wanted the law to intervene. We trusted on the law. That there is a web of corruption within our system. We didn't know. If we knew that there is a web of corruption in our, in our court system, we could have taken the kids by force. Because these kids were born in our families. We, from, from, from day one, they were with us until the mother died. Respect that we gave to the court. They, 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 they are throwing it back to us. Social workers should always consider the facts. They must, all, they must follow events and investigate all proofs. Children, children matters should be prioritized. Thus, they belong to the high court. I don't know how it works, but really, the, the, the children's courts are failing our children. So very soon, the, 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 there will be an, a, a, an exposure of children who have been victimized by an organization called CMR, who, who were sexually abused, who, 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 who CMR has done so many things for many years, and who have been fighting and, and asking the media to bring this to light, and soon it will come out. And the, 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 the children's court is silent, and they know that the, the Dutch reform organization, NPO, is abusing our children in South Africa. Whosoever signed a, a, an agreement with this a Dutch reformed church to abuse our children and to destroy family, that person must be held into accountable. I've been writing to Minister Linda Wezul, and she's ignoring a call which is very important, where children are being abused. Children matters should be prioritized. Does they belong to the high court? We have so many children victimized under CMR and NPO, and no one wants to rescue those children. As, as the Created children's courts proves to be corrupt, and a web of corruption has been created between social workers, lawyers, psychologists, and magistrates to steal in the name of children. If we are to continue using social workers, lawyers, and psychologists, they must be thoroughly scanned before they work on children's cases. Otherwise, they are of no use. I don't say they are used, but if we are to continue, please, please do us a favor. Scan these people before they say to, to parents they must be. Uh, psychologically evaluated. Start with them. 
say, start with them, clinical assessment, interviews, data interviews, and all that, because we have proved that this, these people are very, very corrupt and very, very evil. Let's look at this scenario. The best interest of a child, this term cannot be defined in one sentence. It cannot be defined by one's emotions, but it needs to be defined in characteristics. And that's how we can develop an effective Children's Act, which has no loopholes. Well done. Yes, sir. You've got three minutes to go. I'm about to finish. Once, once there are loopholes in the law, you are actually opening up for corruption. Like what is currently happening in our children's court. When I was in grade one, I was taught of a family tree. This was a good way of teaching a child about the importance of his or her family. It doesn't, the family tree doesn't say one is square square, one is born in Mozambique, one. No, it just talks about parents and relatives and all that. And that's what we need to focus on when we define the, 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 the phrase in the best interest of a child. In a family tree, we have the following branches. There's a child on top, the main character or the priority. On the right side of the tree, beneath the child, there's a father. And on the left, there's a mother. Same level, these people are equal. On the right side of the father, there are siblings of the, paternal, of the father, paternal uncles, aunts of a child. And on the left side of the mother, there are her siblings, maternal uncles, aunts of a child. They are in the same level. Beneath the father, there are his parents, paternal grandfather and grandmother of a child. And beneath the mother, there are her parents, maternal grandfather and grandmother of a child. Same level. These people are equal. Now, this is the life of a child. This is what defines what is in the best interest of a child. A child must not be blocked from one parent or other relatives, and you prioritize the other. Uh, currently, the best interest of a child is defined by material and money. The parent has, the, the parent has to raise a child. That's when the vulture starts coming in numbers. Social workers, psychologists, lawyers, mediators, and presiding officers. These vultures breaks down the family tree by erasing one side of the family tree, mainly the father's side. Anything has to do with paternal family is cut down. Thus, the father is subjected to unnecessary cause. Imagine I was charged 10,000 rand for clinical assessment, assessment without any explanation why I should do that. Supervised visit at more than 600 rand per hour. Per hour, supervised visit to our children that you know, that you brought up. You, 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 you are charged 600 rand per hour. Limited telephone calls, which are also manipulated. In this way, the child's voice is suppressed and is fed wrong information. Chair, my last point is, there is a boy child of mine kept against his will. And this child has been telling the social workers, I want my father. This child last year was locked inside the house and the social workers insulted and chased away. That means that child is kidnapped. The minister Lindy was will know about this boy who's fighting hard to have access to his father. And this is the father. Where do I have a Mondane surname from Mozambique? That's my child. And he has my surname Mondane. If you call me a foreigner, he is also a foreigner. Why is he logged in the house and not released to his father? It's because of our laws. I was jailed when I was only 17 years, just because uh, uh, they couldn't recognize my mother that is South Africa, South African. I, they will only recognize that I was born in Swaziland and my father is Mozambican. By, by, by law, automatically, when my mother is South African, I'm South African. I was, I was arrested at 17 years. And I'm still asking who's going to account for that arrest, even to this day. Now, this thank is what the law needs to. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Montana. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank thank you, you with you at the end. Uh, now, uh, Miss uh, Dr. Stesh. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. May I please uh, get the opportunity to just share my presentation? Please do. If the host can just um, allow me to share, please. You are a co-host, ma'am. You can share. Thank you. Thank you for that. 
uh, just confirm that in fact the settings are fine and that you can see my uh, presentation. Do you see the presentation, Lindy? Not yet, Chair. He's, she's still... Um... Can you switch also on the camera, Doc? We'll do that shortly. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Um, I'd like to just try and uh, share my screen. So if you would just permit me uh, to do that. Is my screen visible now? Yep, 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 yep. Thank you so much uh, to be given this opportunity to present to this committee. And um, our submission detailed every um, piece of the legislation as it relates to early childhood development. And I thought to just use this opportunity to give a succinct overview and an additional background. So we all know that investment in the future workforce starts by investing in the very young from birth. And if you want to scale access to quality ECD programs, uh, we can unlock pathways out of poverty. We can build employment and productivity, and we can level up developmental outcomes for children. Um, South Africans National Development Plan Vision 2030 states that the country intends to um, make ECD a top priority amongst measures to improve quality education and the long-term prospects of future generations. So really very passionate about the plight of child, young children and, and their early um, development in the early years. So over a million children aged three to five years in South Africa have no access to early learning programs. To achieve universal access to ECD for all boys and girls in South Africa by 2030, an investment of 34.3 billion rand is needed into early childhood development. And we need at least 350,000 qualified ECD practitioners and assistants if we want to um, be able to uh, provide universal access. And I think the most thrilling thing is that for every rand that we spend, that we invest in early childhood development, there's a tenfold return, not only for the individual, but also for society at large. So Scotland has proudly been serving children for the past 85 years. And uh, really for us, it's all around how do we make the world a better place for children. And so we uh, set up early learning play groups um, since 2012. And we provide activities for children so that they are able to socialize. And also we act as a referral point for other services. We have two types of play groups. We have a play group aimed at young babies uh, from the age of birth to two which um, is, a, uh, they, the babies are accompanied by the mothers and we do a program um, specifically um, related to that age group. We also have a program for two to four year old groups and we have a nurse that um, does basic health screening and then acts as a referral uh, for psycho, psychosocial and other health interventions. We conduct parenting workshops as part of our early learning play group, play group work and we do, we're very passionate about building capacity in caregivers and in parents. So when we take a look at um, the work that we also do in terms of toy libraries, and that's really the lens that I would like to amplify this, uh, this morning, is to really put the plight of toy libraries on the table and, and, and within sight of yourself, Mr. Chairperson, and the honorable members attending this meeting. So toy libraries uh, provide developmentally appropriate educational play materials to early childhood development service providers, parents, children and this is defined um, in the um, integrated ECD policy. So toy libraries have various ways in which they deliver services. They either provide a common play service, which is two hours, um, a mobile play session where a vehicle goes out, sets up a space in the community and allows for children and their parents to access the services. Also a lend and play service where toys are borrowed, borrowed for a period of, of two weeks and then exchanged the same as you would do with books. 
Um, we also, as toy librarians, do make and play sessions and create toys from waste and show parents how everyday objects can become playful items and can help children to learn. Again, the toy librarian do capacity building and train con the community and members of the toy library on best practice and other related ECD um, information. And then we also participate in events and um, World Play Day, which is coming up on the 28th of May, um, is a really big one for us and I want to encourage the chairperson and others listening to this. Uh, please join us um, in celebrating the importance of play as we do this a very important uh, work of making sure that children access play-based learning opportunities. Parklands is also a very proud member of the Toy Library Association of South Africa, of which I'm also the chairperson and have the privilege of working with 12 other organizations in the country, representing 41 toy libraries and also serving and touching the lives of 17,139 beneficiaries. <laughs> Our reach in the country seems to be more focused on the, on the eastern side, if you look at the map, and, um, and class is working tirelessly to raise the profile and the importance of toy libraries um, within the ECD landscape. So toy libraries has a close relationship uh, with government. So when you look at uh, toy libraries indicated and should be located as part of municipal book libraries, since that is the mandate from uh, imposed on the Department of Arts and Culture. In terms of the Department of Social Development, it's really important that they play a, the role of registering these um, toy libraries and also providing funding. In terms of the Department of Basic Education, the toy libraries work uh, very well within school book libraries um, and can serve children with the, the necessary toys and play materials. And then the Department of Health, which has fantastic coverage and, and um, access to young children through their, their program of vaccinations and um, immunizations of children, um, is a really fantastic place to also locate toy libraries. And I thought to use the opportunity to share a video with you um, very briefly as a, as, a, as a means of showing the work in action. So I do trust that I'll be able to launch this, otherwise I'll just proceed and I could play the video um, at the end. So just allow me a minute. We're here today because we come to launch the mobile clinic together with the mobile toy library. Cotlands is collaborating with Mondi and the Department of Health in a project where we're taking health and early learning to the children in their communities. So rather than waiting for them to come and ask for services, we're taking the services to the community. When Cotlands are introduced to us at the Department of Health and they showed us the Nkondo toy library, I just couldn't wait to see this happening in the province. For any concrete development, cognitive development, and social skills development, you need to catch them when they're still young. For them to have that social skills, ability to navigate life and be future citizens. Mondi facilitated that we all work together because Mondi is supporting the Department of Health by sponsoring them with the mobile health vehicles. The mobile clinic to the community, they've got the schedule, they've got the routes, and the children come to the mobile clinic for immunization and other health-related problems. The nurse will actually provide primary health care to the community and the children, where the toy library will then set up a place where the parents can register their children and set up an area which is really conducive for the children to learn while they play. you see access to learning, you see the future of the country. So that's how um, much of our today because we apologies of our work in action. We thought that really just makes it come, come alive and show how what the potential is of collaborating and coordinating the work that happens um, in early childhood. Scotland's also to help solve the problems with um, making sure that we have a workforce that is qualified and can actually take on and deliver these programs have launched our Kotlin's Ignite um, e-learning training platform and we're very proud that we have 66 learners on, on this platform who are working towards a qualification in both toy librarianship but also uh, to be uh, fully qualified ECD practitioners. So when we um, look at um, the impact that we've made um, as an organization 
Um, we're very proud of the 11,859 children that we serve through our early learning playgroup and toy library model at a very affordable cost of around 200 rand um, per beneficiary per month. And of 2,500 adults that uh, participate in our parenting and capacity building training, and then also our latest innovation, the 66 learners that we've enrolled um, onto our platform. So we know that the work that we do benefits uh, both children and the families that we serve. So first and foremost, we provide the access that's needed um, through toy libraries and play groups. Um, the, we are able to offer the service free because it's sponsored um, through government individuals and corporate South Africa. We know that children have fun when they come into our sessions and we see the laughter and the joy of being able to participate in these programs. We see the learning through play, and I'll share with you some um, empirical evidence that we have around the success of our program. And we also see that we can improve children's uh, school readiness scores through these non-center-based programs, as it's defined uh, within the, the ECD policy. Our children receive a snack and a cooked lunch. They have access to the screening by a nurse, by a nurse who uh, can then also do health and psychosocial referrals. We provide toys and play materials from the toy library, which parents can use at home to play with their children. And we feel uh, if we look at some of the amendments we requested in our formal application or submission, um, we feel very strongly that we should start thinking through programs for parents um, in their homes. And then also that we give access to our parents um, and support them in their journey of parenting and also allow and build their capacity. Um, our parenting is quite a daunting task um, and so as a, as a collective, I think that ECD programs and the amendment bill needs to address this. And then also the, to capacitate other organizations. So um, to replicate this model, I think we've got a lot of success stories in the country, but we're not seeing these programs being rolled out at scale. So Kotlin's participated in the early learning outcomes measure, measure uh, study in 2017. And this is a rigorous um, instrument that really tests uh, the um, the programmatic um, impact of a program, and also it's been standardized within South Africa. It also indicates a program's effectiveness uh, in terms of preparing children for grade R. And I guess what excited us the most was the fact that um, it looked at the domains of cognition and executive functioning, emergent literacy, emergent numeracy and mathematics, fine motor skills, and also gross motor skills. So the baselines were conducted in 2017 and the summatives in October of 2017. And these results um, then showed that as because of the work that we are doing, that we were able to shift children's um, school readiness scores from being yellow, so en route, to being ready. And this was really such a fantastic um, opportunity and um, confirmation of the work that we do. So the green on this particular graph indicates the expected standard. So this is where we would like for children to be by the time that they start school. And the yellow indicates the, the grouping of children that are at risk. And then the red are the children falling behind. And so the value of ELAM, e um, ELAM's external evaluation, that we were able to identify gaps in our program. And also, um, in fact, in the the assessments that were done early on in that particular year, we realized that we did not have a very strong fine motor skills program. The team came together, we worked on reviewing the, our learning plans and we refined that specific aspect of our fine motor skills. And as a result of changing those elements in our program in the subsequent months, uh, the children's fine motor scores were able to move from red into green. So in fact, it was sitting somewhere here and then moved into green. So we also know that the toy libraries play a major role to ensure quality provisioning, which ultimately increases um, children's school readiness scores. So we'd like to make a few um, recommendations also with the support of um, the Toy Library Association of South Africa um, and wish to recommend the following um, changes within the Children's Amendment Bill. Our first rec um, recommendation is to provide toy libraries access to funding against set norms and standards to ensure quality provisioning by toy libraries. Toy libraries also need to be able to access programmatic funding uh, so that we can ensure uh, that 
that we um in, so I'm sorry, programmatic funding. Uh, we really feel that there should be a set of norms and standards. There are a set of norms and standards that were developed specifically for toy libraries in collaboration with officials from the Department of Social Development and the Toy Library Association South, South Africa. And we feel that these should be incorporated into the one step registration process. And by considering this, um, recommendation when amending the bill will promote the best practice principles for toy libraries. This will um, also help us expand, um, you know, career opportunities within the sector and that we make sure that we are able to, um, and also we, we would like as a toy library grouping to be consulted when the norms and standards and the registration process are being refined uh, so that we could add our expertise also to, to the thinking as the bill uh, becomes um, changed or amended. We also would like to make a second recommendation, and that is to prioritize programs that are easy to implement and impact um, large numbers of children, such as non-center-based programs. Um, prioritizing non-center-based programs, such as toy libraries, um, in the same manner as ECD centers. Um, so because we know that there's an array of programs and um, that they should each uh, get equal, be afforded equal a status and opportunity. Um, toy libraries impact the lives of thousands um, of children and the programs are quick and fairly easy to implement and mostly make use of safe, secure and accessible place spaces that are located within the community. A government can definitely help the, the cause by providing underutilized municipal infrastructure to operate toy libraries and even um, early learning playgroups from. Our third recommendation to you, Mr. Chairperson and honorable members of parliament is to ensure that the provincial departments of arts and culture set up toy libraries in municipal book libraries. This will ensure that we increase access to play based opportunities. Sadly, the municipal man municipal libraries have failed to fulfill their mandate and and you can also help us unlock discretionary funding for ECD on municipal levels. Scotland has the skills and knowledge to upscale toy libraries in collaboration with government and the Toy Library Association of South Africa. Our fourth um, recommendation centers around as government um, and civil society, we have a collective responsibility to build the capacity of qualified practitioners that are able to deliver quality play-based early learning programs both center-based and non-center-based. We have to address the skill shortage of qualified ECD practitioners, which means they can work in ECD centers or in toy libraries or in early learning playgroups or in a home visiting program. If we do not invest in the ECD workforce, poorer children, according to research, are more likely to receive poor quality programs. And there's an urgent need to build the capacity to reach our goal of universal access for a million children by 2030. We also need to create secure jobs for qualified ECD practitioners by providing them with a living wage and recognizing them as a workforce. Our fifth recommendation to this esteemed committee is to accelerate toy library services and training for parents to facilitate play in their home environment. This has really rung so true when the COVID pandemic, you know, closed all the ECD programs and everybody had to find ways to reach parents um, and to try and keep their programs um, from taking place. So parent training is required to promote and amplify the power of play. Thank you, I'm about to close. And, and, um, and so children spend most of their time at home and they have very little access to these uh, playful opportunities that bring about learning. In closing, amendments to the bill um, that's specific to the toy libraries is a simpler one-step registration process, making sure that the, that the norms and standards consider toy libraries, uh, provincially, uh, you know, working collaboratively with each other, building the capacity of the providers in the community and also providing training to, to parents. And then we also would like to put an appeal forward in terms of the process that may be followed by this portfolio committee. We really would want to urge the committee to commit to strict and urgent timelines for the finalization of possibly the second amendment bill, if that's the decision that gets taken, um, which also meets um, our call for key reforms, to clearly establish who will be responsible for leading the finalization of the second amendment bill, and also to um, 
to secure joint sittings of the Portfolio Committee on Social Development and the Portfolio Committee on Basic Education should be prioritized if we wish to move this, this amendment of the bills um, in the right direction. And then in closing, uh, Chairperson, I thank you and the Honourable Members of Parliament for this opportunity. Uh, let's keep our eye on why we are all here today. It's all about the children, our children, our future workforce. Making ECD work for our children requires political will and a concerted effort to collectively join forces with stakeholders to amend the children's bill and to ensure our legislation is enabling and truly serves the children of our country. We are in this together, and because we serve the children of South Africa, and we are here to help, let's create universal access for all children of South Africa by 2030, and um, so that they, we are able to serve a range of ECD programs uh, which are supported by toy libraries and that are able to operate within a legislative framework that works for all and substantially changes the trajectory of ECD in South Africa. Thank you so much. Um, for the opportunity to present to this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Pleasure. Thank you very much for such a stimulating, uh, very positive presentation. Rather more about how to take things to a higher level. Thank you very much. And Thank all you, those sir. innovative interventions and so on, including Barrett. Thank you very much. Uh, now is Miss Clulo. Uh, she just came in, Chair. Uh, I'll add her as a course as soon as, yeah, she just came in, Chair. Miss Clulo, take the platform. Thank you. Um, I'm not enabled to screen share Lindiwe. You are a co-host, ma'am. You can share any minute from now. Yeah, we can see the presentation. You can see it. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Okay. Um, you got your 20 minutes? Yes, thank you. <laughs> you can use less than that. You don't have to use 20. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, um, everybody, for um, for hosting me today. Um, is that still sharing? Uh, I don't see it now. Does anyone else see it? It has stopped sharing. No, stop sharing. We can just try and share again, please, ma'am. Okay, I'm trying. I don't see. And now? Yes. Okay. Can you see it? Uh, Thank you, yes, okay. Okay, well, thank you firstly for accommodating me at such short notice. Um, I apologize that I was unable to present uh, the other week. Um, and thank you, honorable chair and honorable members of the committee um, for allowing me this opportunity to present. Um, my name is Suzanne and I am a member of um, the Cindy Network. Um, Cindy is um, a network of organizations, um, member organizations based in KwaZulu-Natal who work um, with children. Um, we are also part of um, a, a group of other strategic partners that work nationally um, to do research and advocacy around um, children's care and protection. Um, over the last um, six years or so, we've had opportunity to consult with over 500 adults and children um, about what family and care and protection means to them. And here's what some children, what some of what the children have told us in those reflections. Um, children have told us that they want to be loved and cared for and to be supported. They want to belong to family. 
and they want to feel safe in their emotional and physical spaces, and they want to be listened to and respected. Cindy is also part of a global alliance called Family for Every Child, which works to ensure that children, um, where possible, grow up in families and whatever size, shape or form that family might take. And we believe that children do best and thrive when they're in family-based care. In practice and research, um, we refer to the best interest of the child. And um, at Cindy, we believe um, acting in children's best interest means that we listen to them about things that impact their lives. And we make sure that enough is being invested in families um, as, the best practice, as the best place for children to go mm -hmm. up, um, that we ensure that there is adequate recognition of their emotion they need. The challenge in the current situation